thank you very good morning to one and all myself dr dn ganjewar iqc coordinator and head department of english msp mandals arts commerce and science college kille dharur district beat maharashtra friends i welcome you all for the one day national webinar sponsored by marathwada shikshan prasarak mandal aurangabad and dr baba saheb ambedkar marathwada university aurangabad this webinar is collaboratively organized sponsored and organized by msp mandals arts commerce and science college kille dharur district b friends i welcome you once again it is a one day webinar on modern and contemporary literatures in english from heritage to identity and power to confrontation at the inaugural session the president of this webinar is principal honorable principal dr shudha shirsat sir i request you let me give the permission to start the webinar of inaugural session thank you sir friends owing to our patrons honorable sri prakash dukey ex state minister and mla and president marathwada shikshan prasarak mandal aurangabad honorable sri satish bahu chavhan mlc and secretary msp mandal aurangabad honorable sri jaising bhaiya solunke chief member college development committee acs college kille dharu all the dignitaries of the college development council sri lobhaji chavhan member cdc acs college dharu honorable sri ajay singh dikhat member cdc acs college dharu honorable sri indrajit jadhav member nyt college development council acs college dharu honorable professor sri mukundrao sawant member nyt college development committee acs college dharu honorable sri dr ram shingare member nyt college development committee acs college kille dharu honorable principal dr shivda shirsat the president of the inaugural function vice principals dr m n gaikwad professor m a jogde and the chief organizer uh, committee of this webinar friends it is a webinar that is that has to be organized by us uh, in the first session of the diwali before diwali vacation It's due to covid 19 we have uh, taken uh, the permission of Uh, honorable msp mandal aurangabad to organize this uh, webinar uh, after uh, post diwali vacations friends i welcome welcome you one and all because this is a modern and contemporary literatures in english webinar first of all i request the president of the inaugural uh, come keynote address session principal dr shudha shirsat sir to give the introductory speech principal dr shudha shirsat sir principal dr shivda shirsat sir over to principal dr shivda shirsat sir sir is going to be online he will definitely come within a minute so friends i take this opportunity to welcome all the delegates participants and resource persons especially professor charles joseph professor deepak nayar 
and all the resource uh, professor dr mrudula ma'am and professor nitonde friends it is a great opportunity for us that our college is going to organize this webinar organized by department of english i think principal dr shuda shishat is live now i request principal dr shuda shishat to give the introductory speech okay thank you sir good morning all of i principal dr shubhda sirsat welcome you all of on the behalf of msp mandals arts commerce science college kille dharun first of all i salute the sacred memory of let vinayak rao patil let ram rao ji avargaonkar and let sundar rao ji solanke founder of markwada shikshan prasarak mandal aurangabad today i am very happy because this is national webinar of our college i am grateful to honorable mla shri prakash dada solanke president marathwada shikshan prasarak mandal Honorable <coughs> MLC Sri Satish Bhau Chauhan, General Secretary, Marathwada Section Prasarak Mandal. Honorable Sri Jay Singh Baya Sodanke. Honorable Sri Lobaji Chauhan. Honorable Ajay Singh Dikkar. Honorable Sri Mukund Sawan. Honorable Dr. Ram Singhare. Honorable Sri Indrajit Jadhav. The Office Bears of All Organization. have given their best wishes for this webinar the keynote address of this webinar professor dr charles charles joseph peri science college mysore resource persons professor dr deepak nair samadhya college of arts and commerce bhivandi thane mumbai dr Murtila Sharma, Meherchan Mahajan, DAV College for Women, Chandigarh. I welcome to the faculties of different colleges who are participate in the webinar. I give best wishes to the convener of this webinar, Dr. B. N. Ganjawar, Vice Principal Dr. Milind Gaikwad, Professor. Mahadev Jogde and also handling the technical side of this webinar, Mr. Abhijit Munde and Professor Ananta Gade. It is the important day for us today that we have hosted the online one-day national webinar webinar on modern and contemporary literature in English. the modern and contemporary or new literature in english are not that new all together they have they have emerged from process of colonization that transformed large tracts of the world from the late 15th century onwards and some of them can trace their beginning to the 19th or even late 18th century when english irish or scottish settlers in the caribbean canada or south africa first began to create an overseas literature and enslaved or colonized people first began to reflect on their current situation and future perspective utilizing the medium of that was them the colonizer tongues other literature in english are indeed new sometimes starkly so as distinct literary fields west african literature in english emerged in the 1950s east african literature in english in the 1960s indigenous writing in canada 
Australia and New Zealand in the 1970s and Black and Asian British literature in the 1980s, while a new literature usually refer to modern experiments in style, narrative, techniques, linguistic experimentation, etc. As an Faulkner, Joyce, and existential writers and similar literature, certain thematic trends can be discerned as well reflected in the narrat narrative and linguistic experimentation among the among them are the relations of selfhood versus membership in a society the balance of history and future prospect the inner dialogue of the mind of characters versus the linguistic speech acts of the character and of course the rewards and danger of moving away from tradition towards individualizing this then mark a new function or literature not merely fictionalizing, fictionalizing storytelling function but a social challenge to rethink the world around us from time to time new literature joined a larger modern art movement to look at thing carefully to give leisure importance to the past in short the present literature in english act as form expression for each individual some books mirror society and allow us to better understand the world we live in however this literature confirm the real complexity of human conflict as we know very well that literature is reflection of humanity and a way for us understand each other thank you very much thank you for your inspirational speech so friends without making any more delay let me first of all introduce to you to the uh, keynote address addresser the keynote addresser for today's session is professor dr charles joseph he is a renowned literati and head post graduate department of english terrestrian college mysore karnataka friends sir has been uh, well connected with our institution for the last decade may i uh, now introduce professor charles joseph as one of the best pioneers of modernism who has contributed a lot to literatures in english friends without making any more delay let me tell you the topic of the keynote address that is a sneak into facets of modernism so i request professor dr charles joseph to have the keynote address to our delegates professor charles joseph good morning sir morning. thank you very much for the opportunity uh, am i audible yes sir yeah uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, uh, it was quite interesting to listen to the uh, principal speaking so much about uh, modernism and literature and even uh, caribbean literature it was uh, quite exhilarating to uh, listen to him uh, about the uh, different facets that he has Uh, that he has registered that literature has done uh, during the modern era and uh, it was it was quite appreciative that uh, uh, he also had the view that uh, colonialism ha was very much uh, responsible for the very version of modernism that we have which is which is a very great uh, research uh, idea and a research output as it is uh, now coming to the very question that um, i need to discuss is that Uh, there's quite a lot of things in modernism to speak, but then uh, to begin with, I will do my PPT sharing uh, so that over a period of time I will discuss things which we have. Uh, 
I hope I hope my PPT is visible. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, now uh, this is a this is a very uh, interesting. I uh, rather I should say this is a very 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 reflective and a very uh, integrated term when we use the word modernism. Modernism is a term that we people have to understand when it comes to the very question of what uh, the very concept is all about, what the uh, very picture here is all about, and the very concept of modernism determines the way how uh, certain things have happened without our knowledge and certain things with our knowledge. So to begin with, I have made it a point to share uh, the theory of modernism, particularly when I'm speaking here about the features of it, how did it influence, what are the different influences that it had on, not only on literature, but even on many, thing, uh, many things other than that. And apart from all these things, what actually were the reflections uh, related to that is what is something that I have here with me. So to begin with, uh, this is the very basis of modernism. It's a it's a movement which basically started as an international. Why do I call it international as a movement is because it is it is something which affected and influences influenced many things around the world. In fact, to be very particular, it drew a lot of ideological status from what we were to what the kind of situation it was. If we have to very clearly say, most of those writers who came at the end of the Victorian era, the kind of language that they started using or the kind of uh, ideological apparatus that they started uh, reflecting uh, in the book or in their works started representing so much of modernism, though they were in the Victorian era, going by the time that we are into, we find them so much of, uh, you know, for find them so much of modernistic thinking into them. Something very beautiful about the very concept of uh, modernism here is that it is a movement which influenced architecture, arts, craft, film, literature, movies, even for that matter, it even influ influenced painting, uh, where we were still in the very brink of or on the edge of Victorian era, where many things influenced us to get into modernism, or rather many things influenced us to become, uh, you know, modernist in ideological apparatus, modernist in ideological thinking as it is, where we were named as modern only at a very later stage, but then we started having the very modernist ideas quite before the very term modernism came or modernism was branded on us. And even uh, to add salt to injury into this point is that even before modernism came to an end, we are, we are living in a postmodern world. So these are things where you do not find a very peaceful or a very socialistic or a very, 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 uh, very programmed kind of an end of anything. But then it, it divided itself into it. That's the reason so you find it started in the later half of the 19th century, but then it came to an end, or rather I should not say, the very features of it started becoming very brittle, started becoming quite old and frail, by which it started to get into the 20th century feature, where in the 20th century, in the middle of it, postmodernism and even a lot of structuralist theorists began to, began to dominate the very feature into it. This was the very idea, this was the very feature that we find that not many things developed itself into it not many things developed itself into the very very idea of it this happened to be the very the, to be the most important feature that you find that 20th century developed itself into these kinds of things now what is the very time or what is the very composition of it to be very particular, it falls between realism and postmodernism. So this is a period where, or this is a theory, which lived between the time when people were bored off with the realism, 
or people who are quite stuck with the realism or the very very realistic identities that they had and they started to develop themselves into postmodernism so in betweenness of something is what is something where modernism is now there's a there's a very important point here to be noticed with modernism here is that it is not the question that realism uh, you know died and modernism uh, you know it gave birth to modernism it is not that there are many books other than uh, you know other than the literary works that we have which gave rise to it one of those most important writers that i should very particularly mention in this uh, in this particular uh, juncture is that uh, a theorist or a critic and a fortune teller i think for me he is a fortune teller a, a fortune teller like matthew arnold gave the real idea that there is no image of culture there is no image of idea that we had in the previous world and we are here to develop it at the present situation that is one the second instance is that he also made it a point to divide the culture between the low culture and the high culture and apart from that there was the kind of society that we lived in which gave a very watertight compartment apart from arnold another very important person who you know a writer who who gave a humorous amount or rather i should say a humongous amount of uh, you know influence on the term or the tenure becoming modernist is that somebody like thomas hardy where hardy's novels have so much of experimentation on the psychological relationships between human beings or psychological relationships between uh, between the so called thinking it is so much that you cannot make it a point to share anything at any point of time you cannot make a point to share it as a point to say saying that can this these kinds of relationships also exist can these kinds of features also become a part of something which is which is not there into this feature see for example when you read a novel like written of the native where you find clemio bright and eustacia why the way that eustacia why wants a man who comes from the center of the world which is none other than paris and this man clemio bright is nowhere interested in going back to it and she wants somebody to take the person there and these kinds of things did not happen in any of the books previous or earlier and another book of hardy to be very particular to speak about you find you find a book like uh, uh, you know hardy's for that matter jude the obscure but in jude also you find something so prominent you find something so uh, you know so very realistic into that image that you do not find the very picture of the realism where this girl like you know susan you know the this girl susan is not in a situation to get into anything very particular she is not in a situation to to find the relationship anything should she go to somebody like uh, philipson or or should she stay back with uh, you know jude or should she go with her ambition these are the features which gave rise there and for a greater extent the women that are present here in any of the novels of hardy are between the point that they do not blur the line that they are fighting against feminism or they are fighting against themselves they do not make it a point to make it so very particular and comparative that that the, their fight is something which is against the social realism they do not make it a point to say that it is because of that reason that most of the institutions that you have in the world were destroyed during the time of during the time when uh, hardy's jews jude was written it is because of that reason even today if you make a point to buy uh, a rupa classics uh, version of uh, uh, you know jude the obscure book the very cover page the, the very first page of the preface you find it said that the bishop of canterbury the archbishop of canterbury made it a point to burn the books of uh, you know jude right in the circle where he said that this is this book is destroying the entire culture this book is destroying the entire social realism that which we find it into this place this is what is something that we find it in this reality where you find it does it ranges so much of movement it ranges it gave rise to so much of movement that people made a point to analyze themselves or rather i should say people made a point to you know speak about so many things so many future futuristic identities that they never made a point to come out of anything where people did not have the mindset to accept anything 
people did not have the mindset to say that yes this is what is the way how things have been happening this is the way how things have been uh, you know reflecting on itself this is what is something which you do not find it happening here into this movement of things that we have now apart from that this is the most important definition i should say or rather uh, or rather where you call it the faith line or uh, you know the war cry of modernism if i have to put it in the modern boys terms i have to say this is a transformation or modernization as an image happened when you have a transformation of culture and society which emerged because of embracing a combination of new ways of thinking and new technology so you have a new way of thinking you have a new way of identity you have a new way of technology when the society embraced that there's a new form of theoretical feature that it give gave rise to i should say i think i think i should say we people in humanities particularly uh, you know people who study literature uh, are, are 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 people who are so very interested into it we had the rise of medical humanities as a stream we had a rise of gender studies as a stream we had a rise of you know the social realistic or the scientific humanities as a stream which was rising into it and we lived in a world where post humanism uh, features of post humanism theories were giving rise so much into it that we cannot still remain or keep ourselves to uh, keep ourselves limited to uh, you know the modernist uh, to limited to the theories that we have we had to adopt a scientific commercial social media studies and theories into it by which when we started to adopt all these features and we began to adopt all these features covid was something which gave a, a break to us where all of us who have taken literature as a stream for our lifestyle literature as a stream for the life that we are leading is, is leading us to a particular picture is leading us to to a particular sociological image that we cannot make a point we cannot make a point to understand the very realistic element that says that we are still into that feature we have to adopt scientific ways we have to adopt commercial identities we have to adopt something which is on rocket science so that and we integrate it into literature and covid brought a still stun to humanities particularly that we cannot make a point to think about something which is at a very leisured feature which is at a very leisured idea this is the most important feature that you find in the book this is the most important feature that you find into the book where anything that you discover anything that you find in post humanism today is something which was almost like foreseeing it was post humanism was almost like tarishas for us it came and gave us a sign that humanities and modernism has to be accepted and post modernism has to be accepted and gone to the next level before covid told us that that everything is going to stop this is what is something that you find where when this happened modernism also happened please understand unlike the way when we had uh, you know modernism science technology you know new thinking new ways of identity scientific approach of things all these started happening through darwin through hardy through sigmund freud through lacan through so many other theorists and even we had a host of migrant writers also who started coming to england so at this point of time when we find something so beautifully emerging into we had the break of the first world war but people had to accept that this is a modern world don't you think 100 years from then it is the same kind of a situation which is happening where we are still you know we, we were lingering we were thinking we were dragging our legs lazy into it and we have this very image into it see here it is a reaction to modernization a means by which a particular society can absorb the shocks that rapid and radical change can cause it is <clears throat> you can you it is it is a process by which a society at a rapid or a radical cause is making it a point to absorb the shocks that we are getting into see to be very 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 particular the world which at one point of time used to mourn and cry and announce for seven days of mourning or 10 days of mourning when somebody great and big died we have people who are dying so many hundreds and lakhs in numbers we do not have time to stop and think and cry and weep and mourn and go to the next person because by the time you are doing all these things you might be the next person going you know going to the death 
the next round which because you do not have time to think about anybody else where it is not that you have to be inhuman in the uh, in the present contemporary world because of the kind of things you have but we are here into a change where it is a natural phenomenon it is a natural feature we need to accept that and we need to go on this is what is something which modernism also told long ago post humanism is also telling now where we need to make it a point to relate ourselves to the features that we have at present and go on now he gives uh, i mean i've given something very uh, very simple as it is which says that modernism and postmodernity or modernity and postmodernity as it is it refers to historical and sociological configurations where you speak about how how it gives rise to the different kinds of social features how it gave rise to for example a book like catch 22 or for that matter when for for instance uh, when you find you find a book like uh, uh, you know uh, the grapes of wrath uh, john steinbeck or even for that matter a very very famous book uh, like uh, you know uh, gravity's rainbow all these are things which have those configurations which are very particularly found let me tell you something one of those modernists that we have objected and put the person close to the garbage or rather i should say into the garbage almost is a writer like charlotte uh, uh, charlotte gilman perkins who has written a very beautiful essay i should say a very beautiful short story like the yellow wallpaper or even for that matter when you read her book called herland her novel which is actually a novella the the size of the book but then the content of it is so much nobody makes a point to read her unless and until gender studies came almost in 1970s or you know thanks to judith butler she made a point to give rise to so many thinking so many different kinds of thinking that it 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 uh, adopted itself into such kind of features that we have and then it had cultural and epistemological concepts where you find the best example i can give that is a, a poem like tall and man or even for that matter where you find something very beautiful for cultural and epistemological concept is is that burnished throne about of cleopatra that we read it in wasteland where you find the way how how the throne is described of cleopatra or even for that matter the the grail element that you find in the christian idea which is so very neatly and easily accepted at understood which is so very neatly uh, you know accepted and understood when it comes to the very very identity of it this is what is something that we find in the book this is what is something that we find it very very obvious and very particular into the epistemological feature that we have this is what is something that is more identical this is what is something which is more uh, you know epistemological into its conse consequential feature and then modernism is a cultural experience of modernity see see the way how though both the terms are like the verb and the verbal noun of it you say it is a cultural experience how are you going to look at please remember it influenced architecture painting art everything that we rarely find whether we should go back to the realistic feature that we had or should we go back to the feature instances that we have thanks to a book like origin of species by uh, by uh, darwin where he makes it a point to write a very very important cultural identity where he says that do not go to the church to find the very feature that all of us were born out of adam and eve we had our history we had our ancestral history coming from a developmental feature where we have been striving and struggling to get into this feature where he says that very interesting feature that it is you know it is there is this there is this artificial uh, you know development that happens there is the scientific development that happens there is this genetic development that happens where the kind of things that you adopt makes you the kind of person that you have don't you think what darwin says that for your survival of the fittest which he said way back in his book in uh, origin of species which suited the very rise of modernism don't you think we need a book like that we need a book like that to suit to the very idea of things which is into the present contemporary post humanistic world thanks to a writer like richard dawkins who says that everything is a scientific discovery that we have but then there is a very big gap between what darwin says and what is happening at present there is somebody the somebody who is necessary to fill the gap which is at the present feature that we have this is what is something that you find it here 
And he says, it is an aesthetic complement of modernity. There's a change in the social sphere. So there is there is aesthetic complement of modern ideas. There is there's so much of aesthetic ideas which you find it. There's so much of aesthetic feature that you have here as an element to understand and adopt to the very juncture of it. And then it says it's a drive for change which is rooted in the disruptions to social life brought about by modernization. It is a drive. It is a change. It is a root which has disrupted so much into life that we cannot make a point to go back into. To it for example a very good line a very good thought to uh, make a point to understand here is that if you read a novel like uh, ulysses of james joyce though james joyce's ulysses and uh, wasteland were published in the same year something very beautiful that you can find here into this picture is that they say that the way he started preparing tea where until the point when he comes to the point where he starts preparing tea the the story is running horizontal after the point when he starts preparing tea, where the story is running inside him, the story is vertical. The story is vertical. Now, the very question is that what is your social life? It represents. And even for that matter, uh, where you where you find a social life uh, in, a mo in a book like uh, Wasteland, where he, where he finds, you know, he says saying that a hot gammon, you know, a hot gammon, you know, we need to present there. And then a hot water at 10. Yeah, he says hot water at 10 and then a gammon and then a closed car if it rains at four and then go back and you sleep. And he says that there are camisoles and suits and slips and petticoats everywhere around. And you have here a person who's who is here at a typewriter waiting for somebody whom you don't know. See the way how modernization is about so much of differences of social thought. Thanks to uh, thanks to people who have written modern theories, modern idea, ideas, which you have, where they say saying that there is there is nobody who's serious about anything, even even the so-called sex, which is physical, which interrogates your religious relativity into it. People are not serious about that. We, you you know you have to be married to get into these kinds of physical relationships. People who are not even bothered about this. This is the most important element that you find. This is the most important feature that you have it here. And he says, now modernity, when you say, or modernism, when you say, it's a historical period. It had, uh, you know, a tradition which was marked where we had the tradition of society, religion, education, relationships, even ideological status, and even to a greater extent, the structure of architecture that we had, which brought change, innovation, and dynamism. These three things brought such great differences. We lived in a world where, we lived in a world where People did not give rise to innovation, did not give rise to dynamism, where the fight which happened at that point of time is what is something that they that it gave rise to a feature like this. And then this modernity, which you find, it consists of industrialism, which speaks about the transformation of nature or the development of the created environment where industrialization was one of the most important features for people to move from there. Now you should ask me a question, so, uh, sir, what don't, don't you think you are drawing lines of industrialization or industrialism of this and even the industrialism that you find in, uh, you know, what is represented in the works of William Blake, because there also you have the representation of the city and the village life, the urban and the rural life, which you find where you find the innocence and the experience, which is very form, very formidably di divided itself into what is village and what is city. This is what is something that you find repeatedly happening after a path breaking book. A path breaking book is something which is which is so very clear into our picture that we are somebody whom we cannot make it a point to understand the very realism that we have. And at every point of time, we are at one juncture, we are at one, uh, you know, uh, you know, futuristic view that we cannot make it a point to say saying that this movement has aff affected nothing. It affects everything that you have and the world wars were the most important landmark 
months into it because it brought a feature that people lost faith in everything people lost faith into anything that we have please understand here it says capitalism and surveillance of social uh, you know supervision that he speaks and here also we lived in a world where people felt the whole world felt before covid was stuck into it that we can buy everything with money you have money you can buy anything and everything out of money we got into a feature where where we where, where we were nowhere concerned where we were nowhere into the picture which says that yes this is what is the very fee instance that we have this is what is something that you find it in the surveillance this is what is something that you find it with capitalistic features also where there was a lot of money power into it which was adopted at one point of time and then he also speaks about military power he also speaks about the way how the wars influenced and this modernity was marked by the poverty and the squalor of industrial cities it was marked by poverty it was marked by the industrial identities it was as all of us know was influenced by two world wars we had death camps we had the threat of the global annihilation don't you think all these four things except the world world war even to a greater extent i can say uh world war rather than two i should say yes two only here the covid and the vaccine which is the two destructive don't you think all these four suits the present time that we are into where there is poverty everywhere nobody is rich nobody is poor there is destruction of the world because of the very entry of covid and people are back into the very picture where there is a reconstruction happening and there is a, at the same time there is a deconstruction also happening and then being positive at the note all of us have seen the huge amount of dead bodies we have seen a war happening around us we have seen the war happening inside us but then the very feature is that death is around us you can also be a victim of that provided your immunity is not good here also you can also be a person of death provided you are not somebody who is safe from the place where the war is so this is something which you find it and the global annihilation you people need you know i i think i may need uh, another 2 hours to finish only global annihilation see see the way so some examples to give you is this is the way how people have made it a point to speak about how certain things started to happen at the end where everybody was there into every place see this was a time i should say this was a time when globalism began to adopt itself into a feature now when i say globalism globalism had uh, see i'll i'll show you some influencing features see the way how the very interior of a railway station is designed see the intricacies of it see the way how people have designed to it to show saying that how exactly modernist feature happens to to understand this you need to read uh, ezra pound's very famous poem called in the station of metro where you find something something so beautifully written it is just 13 words poem where it speaks about what apparition of these faces with wet black bows which means to say that everyone is like a ghost they come and they go and there is nobody who looks at the other person which means you are a person who's into a metro you do not know what is happening around you this is the very point of feature that you have and then see the way how 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 the very modernist architectural feature that you find it very competently being existent and then see the kind of bridges that you find all these are, all these are influences of the way how people began to make or bring in modernist ideas into it modernist features into it now this when i see this i i am reminded of something uh, which is of uh, a very important person who who define what is globalism globalism when i say globalism is a definition or rather it is it is everything is everywhere where where you find if you want to show what is globalism there are three things which brought great revolution into this world one is discovery of electricity the other one is the discovery of uh you know internet and the other one is the discovery of computers or rather the other way around the discovery of computers and the discovery of internet these three things brought such great revolutions probably what we were for centuries and millions of years we are here 
into a feature where we adopted or rather moved from those things which were not at that point of time to such a feature that we have adopted to things which are into a completely different and an unidentical feature. This is what is something that you find. And now to define what is globalism, globalism is something which, uh, which you find it very, very, very obvious in existence. I will give you something which all of us know so that we understand what is the very feature of globalism. See, globalism is, I will give you a definition. It says, it, it, it is like this. Uh, if you have seen the headlines of uh, uh, the death of Princess Diana, okay, where you find uh, the day when she died, the newspaper had this feature. She's, she's an English princess, a Welsh princess who came who had a, a, a consort or rather a person with whom she was into, who was an Egyptian, basically a Pakistani, uh, a, you know, I should say connected. This man made it a point from there where they came out of a French hotel, got into a German car, which was driven by, which had a, a which was had, which had a Dutch engine where it was a Scottish driver who was full of whiskey, uh, he, he drove her into a Swiss built chunk tunnel where they were chased by Italian, Korean, Chinese mobikes and scooters. They were, she was rummaged into a, uh, you know, tunnel, which was built by, uh, uh, which was built by an African and she died. And an American doctor treated her with a Brazilian injection and he said in French, saying that she's no more. This is the very feature that we are global citizens. Everything is everywhere. This, thanks to modernism, it gave rise to so many features of this. It, thanks to modernism, it gave rise to so many other ideological instances which were relating to this. This is what is something that you find that the book is giving you an idea, that the book is giving you a feature which is not so completely into indifferential things that we have. And see here, he says, the history and civilization were inherently progressive. So they were, they were, they were progressive to such extent that we began to adopt things thanks to a book uh, like The Golden Bav by James Fraser, where we find things existent not only from the point of view of what is uh, you know referent or what is indifferent, but then we also get to know saying that we need to reread history thanks to books like, uh, uh, you know, Naipaul's I India Wounded Civilization, or even for that matter, uh, thanks to a book like um, Achibe's, uh, Achibe's response to uh, Joseph Conrad's, uh, you know, uh, heart of darkness where he said that they are black and things like that and how exactly racism has to be fought and see the way how this man made it a point to reflect on it that black was not dirty these are things that you have when you speak about modernism modernism slowly efficiently directly and even to a greater extent gave rise to a thought gave rise to a feature gave rise to an identity which said that yes there is history there is philosophical feature there is an ideological impetus there is an ideological uh, you know feature that we have this is what is something that you find and then the progress was something different where the progress was not something which was always antithetical to the society. But then you should also understand that progress brought in a lot of development that people began to make a point to discover things from one point to another. Now, there were people after this point of time, people made it a point to stay or say that uh, you know this was this was one of those features that they found uh, that uh, they they had uh, this as an element into it this has an element into it by which some people said that modernist thinking was not necessary for us we did not have to live into a world which was like this for example a writer like author Schopenhauer uh, uh, where, where, where he made it a point to say, saying that the world still has a lot of ideas. The world still has a lot of thinking, which is realistic and identical into it. This is what is something that we have. And even for that matter, Darwin's evolution theory that I discussed already with origin of species, where there is a lot of thing which happened here into it. What Darwin writes is something which is against what Bible had written way back from the fourth century. 
here now something which is very important is that bible is a book of books which had the documents of so many people so many things and so many ideas but then something very beautiful for us to understand into darwin is that what darwin writes was something which was against what christ or church or so called the religious belief had already believed and built an institution in itself they did not accept that man came from an ape or man is an alter version of an ape they did not prepare to accept because they all felt that man is an accepted version of what is something that you find with what god will what god had created what adam has created now the same version is what is something that you find it with the works of uh, you know richard uh, sorry uh, with the works of richard dawkins where he he makes it a point to have his books like the selfish gene or the god delusion for that matter which got into such interesting amount of features such interesting amount of uh, you know thinking that we had and then even somebody like karl marx is das kapital thanks to thanks to the marxism that we have here thanks to the marxism that was adopted by a uh, guy delusion gutare or even for that matter um uh, michel foucault the kind of things that they discuss power and autonomy and things the way how they wrote is what is something that we people these people have adopted itself into it and then the way how archaeological ideas into it and even sigmund freud he studies about the way how hysterical and the primacy of the unconscious mind which is at the very central point of the mental life or how exactly certain things happened into it now even somebody very nice that you find is frederick nietzsche somebody whom you cannot forget is frederick nietzsche because without frederick nietzsche you cannot make a point to understand what is derrida because derrida's very famous essay speech which turned into an essay called structure sign and play is something which has a reference of this where he makes it a point quote from levestros's very famous book called the raw and the cooked this is what is something that you find it here into it and even for that matter a book like henry bergson's which differences between signs uh, the clock time and the directive subjective time and the experience of time which you find a very good example for this would be martin heidegger's time and act uh of you know time and action this is what is something which you find it where where you find the hedegerian identity which is completely different which is completely futuristic that you find and now when you began modernism i should say from where did it rise who were the contributors how exactly did it come a historian like william everdell he started to say that there is this development which is happening in the 1870s itself where he said modernism in the 1870s had an influence had an identity had a logical feature into it the second instance is that it is an element of greenberg it's an element where an art critic like uh, uh, clement greenberg made it at the beginning or in the middle of the 19th century in france which means to say that everybody noticed that there is innovation that is happening everybody noticed that there is there is a facet of it happening but what is more important it does we adopted it into literature but then we did not present it so because victorian society did not have a victorian compromise the very victorian compromise started with the works of hardy where they wanted it to be adopted please understand for a great writer like hardy who wrote novels like tess of the diabolos or for that matter for or for that instance a novel like uh, woodlanders he made it a point to to stop writing his novels and he started to uh, you know he started to write poetry after that see the way how somebody is influenced so much that they cannot adopt into it which means to say whether it is history or whether it is visual art or whether it is music or whether it is architecture it did not influence so much unlike the way we had somebody writing in it somebody making it a point of writing in it even today we are into a world which says that where people make it a point of have, you know having things around everywhere in the world but it does not influence them but then when somebody puts a post on twitter when somebody makes it a point of declaration on facebook or somebody makes it a point of putting a putting a comic or a meme or even for that matter a, a jerd a kind of a feature or even for that matter a kind of uh, the comic features that you find it 
mentioned on Instagram, you find it more happening, more discussive, more futuristic, more adoptive into anything that we have, which means to say literature today is leveled at a point of time where we need to adopt certain features, which is not that easily possible. And here, see Baudelaire's books, or even for that matter, Idod Mane for in painting or Flaubert's uh, picture, anyone, anyone, uh, who has read Flaubert will 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 certainly make it a point to understand that Flaubert is is a great writer. Flaubert is a great uh, you know a, a theorist, a presenter of art as someone who is making it a point to say who can who can who can forget a character like Madame Bovary for that matter, or even for that matter who can forget the loyalty that Charles Bovary had that that he never made it a point to understand that women can also be somebody who can go to another person if they are not happy with someone but then he did not believe it at any point of time this is what is something which you find it where Flaubert had written but then people never made it a point to get itself into it and then this is what is something which you find very very beautiful if you people find time Please do make it a point to read these uh, Sjord's Divisionism and even for that matter, a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jaffe, which is which is even more beautiful. For example, a book like uh, I think I think uh, uh, my mind is not stopping me to without referring to this book. <laughs> A sequel book of Jane Eyre is uh, White Sargos O.C., where you find something so beautifully written, something so beautifully represented. Where what is the character of this girl? Can can it can it be a possibility of the way how how you find it? That, that is represented. Is it possible for somebody to? To be uh, in a in a in a situation like this? Is it possible for somebody to be into a into a world of into a world of representations like this this is what is something that he is making it a point to understand here see the way how see see one one very good example is that everybody is here we find people of every other range and category and feature but then nobody is bothered about no one everyone is modern in their outlook see the kind of dress that each one is wearing see the way how each one is thinking of themselves see each one's body language see each one's li lifestyle that you have this picture is something which you can relate it so easily and nice to the very lines that you get in wasteland which is called sweet thames run softly till i end my song though the line is borrowed from uh you know uh you know uh, uh you know spencer you find something very beautiful here is that this is the lines which you find it this is the lines which you have here where people are destroying it you find a reference of this destruction you find a reference of these kinds of things happening here even in wasteland also where it is not a, where it is not something where he's complaining about it where at the end of the wasteland also you feel saying that there is life after spirituality sorry there is life after destruction there is life after all these things which are happening here into it and then he says see modern the very term comes from the word it's a, it's a latin word where i have to go for an etymological feature here which says that it comes from modo means current or movement or of the movement where the unexpected breaks with traditional ways of viewing and interacting with the world, which is unexpected. The way you were all these years, the kind of things that were happening to you, you are nowhere into this picture, you are nowhere into the way how it is. But then at present, you are making it a point to understand the very idea of it. You, uh, you should understand the very, very, very juncture of it. And then it's a reaction against a Victorian culture and aesthetic, and it is a stability of quietude of Victorian era, the thing of the past. So it means to say that you are somebody who is who has the ability to react to the Victorian society. And the Victorian society was something which was very traditional. The Victorian society was something which was which was more you know realistic into its feature. It had a religious clamor, it did not allow anything to go out of the breaks and bounds it did not allow anything to break its darians that you have and then the characteristics that you find here is that it experiments it individualizes 
and apart from that there is a preoccupation of the inner self and the consciousness so which means to say there is architecture there is literature and there is psychological perception that you find where people made it a point to get into the very feature that you have where experimentations were done now the modernist he does not make a point to care for nature being or the overarching structures of history so he is he is making it a point to understand saying that he is not only somebody who is a nature he is not only making somebody who is overarching with the very structure of history that you have but he or she does not progress the growth because there is alienation into every human being there is loneliness that is grown in every human being there is there is this feature of faith and liveliness or even for that matter there is low identity which is growing here into it this is what is something that you find it here and then the beginning of the distinction between the high and the low art which you find it in uh, you know in the works of um, in in the in culture and anarchy in um, in uh, hardy sorry in uh, matthew arnold or for that matter even the educational reforms of the victorian age thanks to uh, macaulay Uh, who, who made it a point to introduce English education system? But if you simply say thanks to Macaulay because he introduced English education system, to put it in a very simple words, it is like crediting uh, the man who scored the winning run to be the only one who. you know played the entire match it is like that because of the effort and the effect of so many people the very instance of english education came into existence but today we all thank macaulay because he was the one who presented the bill at the point when it was considered the others told that in a very different way so this is the cluny method of you know teaching english which we have following it even today thanks to corona at this point of time where because of which online education has come where what we are going to teach what we are going to speak what we are going to learn has been completely different the way how we had seen the teachers all these years has been completely different from the way how we show ourselves to and even for that matter the way how we how we treat it to students is completely different from the way probably we are treating it now so this is what something that we find it on another version where there was greater demand for literature during the victorian era where people may Made it a point to understand, saying that yes, this is the way how the world is into. This is the way how the world is presenting itself into. This is what is something that you have it here, and then the press supplied the demands where where the where there were quite a lot of press printing press that started. People began to publish books. There were so many things that were presented, and there were so many things that people started to get the books in their hands, and each one had a copy with them, and they started to read and write and understand things that they had. Sophisticated literati spawned new popular literature. the real artists found themselves in a state of alienation from the mainstream society which means the real artist here is somebody who represented the way how the society was the way how the social element was and then all the truths became relative in a, and in a state of flux so the truth which was there it it became a state in which people began to adopt things that they have they never made it a point to uh, you know understand the very differences that each one made a point to have uh, it at one uh, you know level of thinking or at one level of social feature that they had and apart from that there were no guiding spirit rules and events of the world absolute destruction was kept in check by only the tiniest of the margins so these were some of those things that you have these were some of those instances that we developed into it now these are a range of movements that developed at this period where it found like abstractionism avant garde construction cubism dadaism futurism situationism symbolism expressionism imagism surrealism even vorticism so these are some of those movements that you had for each one there was a school that started and ezra pound and eliot were somebody who were who were most often influencing most of this because they were they soiled their hands into everything possible and a reflection of that is something which you can see in most of the books that they have written so this is what is something that they found so now when you find an exponent like ezra pound who wrote who wrote cantos or that matter for example t hume who wanted poetry to concentrate entirely upon that thing itself which means 
the thing itself which is you do not concentrate on anything else you do not speak on anything else you speak only on the thing itself where you do not speak when i say book you don't speak about the pages of the book you just speak that the book has four dimensions it has color and things like that so this is the thing itself concept you, it's it's beautiful to teach hume to students but then sometimes it becomes difficult because because the discussion goes on for a longer time and the minimalist language and the way how everything was direct people they never made it a point to say saying that we will live by this or there, there, there was no circumlocution feature into it but then it was quite direct so there was dreaminess there was pastoral poetry it was abandoned and there was a new cold mechanized poetics so th this was something which was unrhymed there was adjectives there were verbal things there were a lot of verbos because victorian poetry had a lot of things in sub in in suffusion to it for example when you read some poems of hopkins you will find a very beautiful line like this i caught this morning morning minions king dam day light dapple dapple dawn drawn falcon so you are you're using such ornamental language there you're using such ornamental painted feature that you find it and then it is characteristic where you find features of people like this where you find so many modern ideas into it ezra pound was someone to whom even for that matter whatever that was characteristic whatever that was written already was dedicated to him you people know that very line which you find in westland which is called il miglio fabo which means to say my better craftsman so this is what is something which which people made it a point to understand in ezra pound see the way how the facets have been changing see the way how the how the uh, identity has been changing from one feature from one adopted idea to another from one adopted you know version of uh, you know lifestyle into another uh something very uh, interesting for all of you to understand with this uh, uh, you know idea is that you find things happening at this point of time things happening at this uh, you know juncture of life not because of the reason that there has been something very different but you have to easily understand that there is something which is which is completely identical into it the something which is completely you know regular and referral into it into this and he says regardless of the apparent senseless or ugliness of the outcome so this is somebody who is just to steen who makes it a point to speak about modernism where where steen also adopts to certain things which have not been into a modernistic world but i'm i'm shifting myself at a very faster pace here because not it's not the reason that i have to go slow but then the time given to me is something like that so he says the duty of the work of art to strive for ugliness only in that way it could be truly new and then he also makes it a point to say that the beauty is lingering in the trace it is it is growing in the past tradition it's growing into the traditional world see steen is making it a point to say saying that the work of art is 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 to find what is the most unrealistic world what is the most dirtiest thing that you find it and you have to present it one very beautiful because it's a college from maharashtra i think i should i should make a point to say this here you you find a book like uh, you know uh, akramashi by sharan kumar limbade his biography that is one of the best books i have ever taught i should say because because akarmashi is one book where where you find such realistic element the realism here there is not that they are showing what they had with them in their life the realism that they had is to show how the society as it is had treated them how the society was reciprocating to them is what is something that you find it very much uh, you know very much present into those books and those books have never been into something where that you find you know anything which is outmodish into this world and even thanks to uh, you know writers like the indian trio that we had like arke narayan or even for that matter raja rao or even for that matter uh, mulk rajanand where where the trio made it a point to present a world which was completely different from the world that we lived in we lived in a world which was completely different any time you see or any book of arke narayan you read the first thing that you get across or the first thing that you come across is that you find the east and the west dichotomy there 
which means to say by the time arkanarayan began to write world had got so much into modernism that we had accepted a parallel image of it accepting modernity completely was something to an extent that it started found its representation into it you will find an english character in any book think for example a character like marco in guide or for that matter a character like or 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 the name that we can give to the relationship between rosie and raju in guide or even for that matter velen and 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 the girl in uh, uh, painter of signs these are things which you find it very uh, very 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 simplistic into its feature these are very simplistic into uh, into the kind of things that we have or even for that matter when you read a book like wale shoinka's lion and the jewel the kind of attitude that that girl had and even for that matter the way how lakunle presents himself is not what is something which you have sidi is somebody who whom you cannot blame it at any point of time and say saying that what you're doing is wrong what you're doing is at a different pace this is something which you find it here coming to the eternally glorious eliot eliot is somebody who is who draws illusion he's intellectual he's ironic and his mode of poetry is something which is completely different from the way how others write for example when you when you when you take up a poem like love song of alfred j prufrock which begins with such a beautiful line which says that let us go you and i like like the patient either you know like the sun is setting the the sun in the evening is like the way how both of us are like the patient either raised upon a table see the comparison that he is using the sun and the sky is compared to the patient and the table so he is not only making it a point of drawing comparison but he is also making it intellectual to understand and then the plight of the modern man is so easily comparable to the plight of you know prufrock where he goes to a place where women are talking about michelangelo the great michelangelo the great painter or the mermaids are singing the song but there is nobody speaking about him there is nobody speaking about even the mermaids are not singing anything about him this is this is the uh, you know indirectional feature that you find it here and he says it looked backwards it looks uh, you know for the inspiration but not nostalgic or romantic about the past it looks about the past it gives a reference right from brahada karanya upanishads in 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 westland you find a reference of uh, you know uh, christ uh, death you find the getsemane episode in the in basel but then you do not draw inspiration from that but then it is just a cross reference which means to say there is no nostalgia about it there is no romantic idea about it it is just a reference where you find an inspiration about it unlike the way the poem begins april is the cruelest month where you are referring to chaucer not because you like chaucer but because you find something very 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 beautiful about the very existence of it and then he says poetic voice is sound like very colloquial but secondary meanings are found so language is so very simple but then there is a uh, you know secondary meaning into it for example you find those lines those were pearls that were his eyes in westland or even for that matter even in even in a poem like uh, uh, you know journey of the magi you will find the reference the the, the silken sherbet girls who were bringing you know uh, you know who were bringing sherbet to our summer palaces we had great time of it this there was death and there was birth and there was birth in death this is what is something that you find it with eliot more often represented but there is there is a secondary meaning into it which means to say going in search of christ those three people who went in search of a birth of a person underwent death so this is what is something which you find something very very prominent into the book that we share and then when it comes to the very country from which he comes he speaks about or there are there are people like steen and hemingway and scott where somebody like hemingway is uh, uh, 
old man and the sea which is which is a philosophical and a phenomenal book has given rise to such great books in canadian literature for example when you read a book like uh, uh, god is not a fish inspector by val gardson he finds his inspiration drawn from hemingway or even for that matter uh, a writer like steenbeck also finds his inspiration drawn from shakespeare and hemingway but they do not write something which is there they write something which is very very particular and sensational they speak about a lost generation a generation which lost because of the war a generation which lost because of the social situation and turning the minds eye in inward attempting to record the workings of it this is something which you find it very 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 compunctional into it something very compunctional into the very feature and now coming to the very genre of the novel that we have he is speaking unreliable and he is speaking about the uh, narrator he is speaking about the supplanted he is speaking about the omniscient he is speaking about the trustworthy narrator for example tyrishius in Way wasteland he is everywhere who is the third who walks beside me the man with the hood here is a man with a wrinkled you know wrinkled breast but with a with a with a with 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 a man who here has who ha here has the features of a woman also this is what is something that you find stream of consciousness i think i should the moment you say stream of consciousness the first person that comes to mind is either henry james or virginia wolf the way how how you find it in to the lighthouse or you know the way how you find the characters in lighthouse the way how lighthouse has been lit with so many interesting instances or even for that matter stream of consciousness is uh, you know the henry james the way how he presents and even to a greater extent the way how we find james joyce's dubliners or or even for that matter when you when you read a book like uh, finnegan's wake Uh, you find the book being very thin, but the notes given to that is around eight hundred pages. This is what is something that you find very beautifully written into it. Survey the inner space of the human mind, where the human mind did not have a space to represent something which had its own reflection into it. Where the first thing is that they experimented with the genre and the form. the genre was something where people started to write in free verse people started to write in language which was both like poetry or like prose people made a point to understand the very reflection of it and then the self consciousness and irony concerning literary and social convention it had realistic fiction it had freud's idea it had the consciousness and the sexual repression that you had see the way how freud is here into it Freud is here so very deeper into it in any character. For example, uh, the young man Carbuncular in Wasteland, or for that matter, uh, Mr. St Mr. Stetson, which you find, or for that matter, uh, the the lady who was the Belladonna, who was making it a point to you know say the you know the kind of things that you find, or for that matter, Philemon, or even Cleopatra that you have. everybody made a point to represent something which was completely different into it and then these are some of those features which you find apart from then which says there was classical and mythical forms refashioned or it was made new or there was allusion which had symbolic references there was self consciousness and intertextuality there was references from one text to another there was reference from one book to another there was reference even for that matter from one language to another you will find uh, you know this is the irish girl in wasteland or even for that matter michelangelo's reference in proof rock or even for that matter the reference of uh, uh, the irishman in um, uh, in in uh, in ulysses these are things that you find or even for that matter the isolation the eccentricity the pessimism and the reaction against the formal limits of realism and the optimism of the victorian era where you are reacting against the limits of the society you're reacting against the limitations of the way how realistic optimism in the society began so it suggests change there is uncertainty there is a risk there is giddens there is modernism there is risk culture <laughs> and then there is all knowledge which happened there into that feature there is open version of it there is open feature into it there is open identity into it this is what is something that you find very 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 formal in its existence so now the literary archetype so first he wanted to make himself the way how 
the character here had it and then the dilemma of the modern development there was interplay of the creation and destruction people made it a point to play within himself play play within the very concern of the social image that you had and then there was a project where your identity determined completely on the way how a project was established of the way how certain things were told and understood and the identity which you have here was not fixed but it was created and it was built on something which you already have for example hamlet was an identity which was already there and a character like prufrock was built on him similarly is with the features that you find and here you find bodeles flanor which is which means a stroller where you find these characters being uh, you know representing so much about it and you find the walking the anonymous spaces of the modern city you find people moving from one place to another people moving from one image of one identity to another you find the uh, william bemson seven lambs of uh, seven types of ambiguity these are things which you find it so very beautiful uh, birdsley and brinsley's books we are so very 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 fashionable into into to these kinds of things that you do not make it a point to present there and even experiencing the complexity the disturbances the confusions the streets with their shops the displays the images and the variety of persons that we had is what is something that we share it here and then the kind of insights from psychology and sociology the anthropological study the comparative religion you find every other thing that i'm representing here through many works of eliot or pound or hume or steen or even for that matter auden or you know when you read when you read auden and yeats for that matter you will find leda and the swan by yeats which which speaks so much about or even for that matter among school children when you read they, he speaks so much in reference to it he speaks an epic in in leda and the swan this is what is something that you find and the shifting power structures the way how the structures have been shifted and the way how certain things and even women into workforce or women working everywhere or women getting into the workforce of things that you have and the very concept of the new city that you have but only this concept of new city consciousness i i i can speak something so very great because there is this third space which was created by them thanks to people like henry lefer bray or even for that matter edward soja who made it a point to create this consciousness that a city that you have at present cannot be created as a city in somewhere else because things are different and radio cinema movie mass media information as technology start to began to things from everywhere i think i think today if you are blaming tv we have to blame modernism because the modernism gave rise to all these things we are now into a world which is like this and no more we can say that tv is an idiot box because it has developed versions of itself it has adopted to change where everybody is into a social darwinism where if you want to survive you need to change you need to show yourself into something else and then there's no absolute truth there's no single truth thanks to this kind of thing by absurd theorists like uh, you know beckett or for that matter uh, you will find uh, you know you'll find you'll find osborn for that matter this the so much of absurdity into it nobody comes nobody goes nothing happens see the way how how there is no absolute truth and the way how jimmy you find it in uh, you know look back in anger or the way how you find a relative feature which you find it these are things which you find it at a relative at a provisional truth and there is a reaction against the dominance of rational and logical and patriarchal discourse and the monopoly of power where you cannot have power at one central system there is power at the monopoly there is power at the central idea this power at the monopolized feature that you find and then there are no linear points there are multiple plots there are multiple narrators there are multiple features that you find you will find for multiple narrations you will find the books of uh, you know streams of consciousness you find or even for that matter the works of uh, uh, you know Virginia Woolf or even for that matter the good old god of small things you find the multiple plot and things that you have so these are things which are so very 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 completely resolved or even for that matter the inheritance of loss 
these are books which you find it very uh, very uh, very com very different when it comes to this question and then the multiple points of view the rejection of a single narrator you do not find in modernist writing single narrator but then in the postmodern narratives also you find similar features and primitivism where you find belief or thought or behavior of a primitive or an instinctual nature so how do you find these things being presented how do you find these things being uh, being told about with the feature how do you find these things being told about into it in something which you have it here which has its own idea which you share it this is what is something which it presents now we have exponents love literature painting dance music architecture where each one has made it a point to find a great picture in themselves i don't think without james joyce there is ever a modern literature that exists though the man comes from dublin though eliot comes from us though ezra pound comes from us there is there is no point where we can say saying that yes they are people of that country they are people of a uh, different world we have to you know can we adopt them we have adopted everybody we have adopted these features this is the place where globalism gives rise to though globalism as a theory give not give we live in a post global world but still still a lot of things happen so this is something which i have as a keynote address for today so who's going to ask me the first question thank you professor charles joseph yes sir um, thank you for your uh very breaking and keynote address welcome the, sir the keynote address is open for discussion if there are any questions please uh, type them on comments we will show them on the screen all delegates are requested to type your questions in comments we will definitely show them on screen and professor charles will answer them Yes, sir are there any questions good day sir are there any questions okay thank you professor thank you for your elaborate your speech on a sneak into the facets of modernism I am really thankful to you on the part of uh, the convener as well as the management and principal of our college. Thank you, sir. Thank you from uh, the bottom of my Welcome. heart. Welcome, Thanks, welcome, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. And then I have to thank you, uh, the organizing secretary, the members of the uh, the other members of the organizing committee, and then the principal who gave uh, this opportunity that he has accepted me to speak there, and all the members of the CDC and the patrons of the college. Uh, thanks a lot. Hope to be in touch with all of you. Uh, thanks a lot once again for the opportunity given. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, same here, sir. Uh, my Christmas wishes to all of you in the college. Uh, have a Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Okay, sir. thank you. Sir. Thank uh, you. Now, thank you. Uh, friends, now we are we move to the next session. Uh, now the next session resource person is Professor Dr. Deepak Nayar. He is a renowned critic and professor, Department of English, Sandhya College of Arts and Commerce, Vivendi, Thane, Mumbai. The topic of his presentation is Geocritical Analysis of Asian Literature. So uh, now I here request Dr. Deepak Nair, sir, to have pre discussion with our delegates, Professor Dr. Deepak Nair. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, can I share the screen now? Hello, sir. Can I share the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Monday, sir. Please help him. Monday, sir. Tell him how to share the screen. Yes, sir. I did it. I hope it's, 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 it's visible, right? 
Yes, sir. Good afternoon, all the uh, dear participants and sir. Uh, first of all, let me thank you and your your management principal and and everybody involved in organizing this seminar and to uh, to give me this opportunity. Such as uh, to present my talk on the geocritical analysis of facial literature. So, the title itself indicates what I am going to discuss in the next maybe one or one and, one and a half hour. The topic is geocritical analysis of Asian literature. Now, it's a relatively new term. It's not a very common term, which is, uh, you know, it can be traced from the 1960s or 70s, not, more be, uh, not before that. Though it was there, there were many writers, there were many philosophers, there were many critics who had actually focused upon uh, geocritical aspects, spatial criticism, and all those things which are associated with geocritical uh, uh, themes. But uh, you may see that uh, after 1960s or from 1960s on, or onwards, this theory or this approach has uh, uh, achieved or uh, it has actually garnered more focus by the writers as well as a critic. So I'll just start with the uh, quote by Isaac Newton where he says, no being exists or can exist which is not related to space in some way. We all know that space, irrespective of where we live, irrespective of where we dwell or uh, irrespective of what we experience, space or space is something that is very much, very much close to us. Right? We can't even think, we can't even leave, we can't even have anything which is not connected to a place or a space. Now, typically when we talk about a space, the first thing that comes to our mind is the outer space, the, the outer uh, envelope that covers our planet. But do we experience the space that we have, the, the, the space that covers us, covers our existence or covers uh, our uh, living uh, places or whatsoever. So this is what we, uh, it's a very interesting aspect if you uh, just try to understand and, and try to study from the uh, from the core level itself. Now, let us start with uh, what actually is geocritism. I think many of you must be knowing all, all, all these things, must have studied these concepts, must have had many papers, research papers, or some of you may have your thesis on this uh, on this topic. But still, just for the new, I mean, those who are, uh, if there are any, any students who are new to it, just I'll give some brief introduction about geo geocriticism and uh, how it has developed, uh, who are the pioneer in developing this uh, approach, this critical approach. So let let me start with the first critic who is claimed to be or who is said to be the beginner or uh, after whose book the geocritism has actually got a shape and uh, uh, received an importance in the uh, critical and uh, literary uh, space. The critic is Burton Westphal. His book, Geocriticism, Real and Fictional Spaces, gives a lot of input about what is geocritism what is spa uh, spatial criticism, wh what is space, various spaces, wh what the impact of uh, uh, various geographical uh, means or geographical uh, features on literature and how authors, how writers and how characters are so, many, so much connected and closely connected to the geo geographical areas or geographical setup that embodies them. Now, what he talks about in this book, just three uh, outline I'll give here. Space in literature and literature in space. What does it mean? It means any literature, you can take up any literature. I've given an example here by James Joy uh, Dublin. The title itself indicates a, a, a place. And when we go on reading this book, you'll come across a lot of various features about Dublin. 
how it is the people the culture the the setup the environment even the atmosphere everything of dublin is somehow and somewhere you can connect when uh, you can actually uh, pictureize imagine and you can also feel you know all factory if you give me so uh, sense you may say uh, while reading dublin by james Joy. so space in literature and literature in space how writers create various spaces in literature the spaces maybe personal spaces maybe uh, formal or informal spaces spaces that matters to the characters ma matters to the writer or matters to the readers or whomsoever so these uh, spaces uh, which are defined and discussed in literature makes a lot of uh, gives a lot of information to the readers when they read now what is literature in space see it is always observed and we all uh, we all have experienced that while reading a book while reading any kind of fiction uh, especially or uh, fiction or non fiction books you know uh, if a writer focuses upon the place or or the space where the action takes up where the action is taking place so indirectly we the readers we the audience are able to create a picture create an image of the space of the place that we uh, that that we are reading about now see uh, see for example you know when uh, just for as an uh, uh, for an uh, uh, example with the advent of new technology with the advent of social media and internet on all uh, other thing that we use today we know that the space and place has uh, has become very common to us like you know in the a previous time when we had only books to refer some magazines or newspaper to uh, to, uh, to refer we don't actually know how those places look like for example now uh, today if you uh, if i say new york or uh, uh, paris there's uh, uh, automatically a lot of pictures about those places come uh, to your mind you may have seen them on internet on maybe in some social media platforms or wherever so literary writing usually gives inputs gives a lot of uh, you know it is filled with a lot of information about the place and space it, uh, it talks about and that's why it, it can be said that space in literature and literature is uh, uh, in space if they both are positively and uh, uh, used by the writers it can give out a lot of impact a lot of information about the space and place it talks about now the study of places that appear in literature how do we study the place for example if you read thomas hardy or if you if you read arkin narayan they talk about some specific spaces a uh, place sorry it may be wessex it may be malgudi right these places do appear in literature some may be fictional spaces some are real uh, real places but still these places these uh, literary works help us to study the places in detail though we never be there no we never been there or though we won't be able, uh, able to be there ever in our lifetime but still the presentation of these places and spaces in the literature by the writers help us to study help us to understand the the, the spaces the places that they discuss now how uh, it affects the perception of real spaces of course you know uh, of course literature to some extent the you know the most of the works of literature are fiction but if uh, if you connect the spaces and places used by them by the writers so you may also uh, we are such to some extent we may be able to realize or pictureize the spaces that they talk about now what is geocritism let me just give some uh, brief outline about the what is what this theory is all about it actually advocates a geocentered approach to literature and culture studies geocentered geographical centered you know in the previous uh, uh, time uh, geography was not uh, you know the literary uh, writers and the uh, uh, the students of literature were not very keen or very uh, are not very interested in studying the geographical effect or impact on on the on the uh, on writing or on the creation of themes or the development of plot or the creation of uh, the actions taken place uh, the uh, uh, actions taken by the characters these geographical aspects and geographical area where this all action takes place were not you know minutely focused by the Uh, readers as well as the researcher in previous period 
but but with the advent of geocritism the focus from characters focus from themes focus from plot and other aspects had somehow changed and diverted towards geocritism because we all know that every action takes place in a specific uh, place you cannot avoid place like aristotle uh, said in his unity you know the unit of time place and action so for him also according to him as well place is an important aspect for any sort of literature any sort of literary writing okay so these spaces allow a particular place uh, to serve as a focal point of a, a variety of critical practices of course you know uh, if you study these uh, places and and spaces minutely with the geographical yeah uh, through the geocritical perspective you can uh, come out with a way, variety of critical practices and uh, and and, uh, and also critical outlooks it looks at the various depictions of that multifaceted zone whether using classical myths modern fiction historical works tourist brochures or something else to form a pluralistic image of the of the place now this literature these literary works whether it may be a myth it may be the mo uh, modern fiction historical works or even the brochure that the tourists or we, uh, we get whenever we visit a new place this literature help us to understand a place create an image of the place in our mind for example while reading uh, the classical myths like ramayana or mahabharata or uh, the story of helen helen of troy while reading we can automatically we can create the image of the place the space where those actions must have taken place the greek uh, uh, pla the places of greece during that time places of india during that time so we create an image so it helps this kind of works help us to create a pluralistic image of the place no place is singular okay for example i am uh, occupying a place today my actions are taking place at a place today it may be possible that tomorrow it is definitely possible that to, uh, tomorrow some other person some other guy will be here acting on my behalf or taking the or doing the action that i am doing today or uh, doing the job that i am doing to, uh, today so place has a pluralistic image right for me one place may be very much uh, sacred for others may not okay so every place has a pluralistic impact a pluralistic view uh, uh, or a pluralistic uh, importance to uh, every person who is directly or indirectly associated with them okay now secondly nextly uh, geocritism understand that the referentiality operating between fiction and the real uh, real, real world is characterized by constant movement or oscillation whereby one can never really uh, fix or pin down the reference it's very true it understand the referentiality operating between fiction and the real world right sometime the difference between real place or real space or real world and the fictional uh, uh, fictional place world or space blurs while reading some books we all have experienced that we get transported to the place or the space where that action takes place we feel as if you are observing you are feeling and you are experiencing the action that are taking place uh, you know while reading whatever you are experiencing whatever you are sensing the actions uh, you know while reading you feel as if you are present physically over there so it's all, uh, it takes you it trans uh, transforms you you know takes you to to that place that's why it may be said that you know referentiality between fiction and the real world is characterized by the constant movement the character uh, the readers and even some characters move oscillate between the places and this help us to pin down the reference to some extent also geocritism considers all writing as a map and main point is to recognize the real and imaginary places it considers all writing as a map now how uh, writing can be map of course you know when we read about uh, the modern fiction uh, or for example james joyce dublin you know it maps the entire city when the character moves throughout the city or uh, if you uh, read some poetry by uh, daruvala like for example when uh, where he talks about bombay where he talks about uh, the olden uh, uh, you know period of bombay you automatically the readers automatically feel you know a mapping of the places or map uh, map 
मैपिंग ऑफ द वेरियस प्लेसेस बीइंग डिस्कस देयर तो जियो क्रिटिज्म इट ऑलवेज कंसीडर्स दैट राइटिंग इज अ मैप इट्स अ मैप व्हिच प्रेजेंट्स अ प्लेस लाइक इट्स अ काइंड ऑफ अ कार्टोग्राफिक इफेक्ट इट्स अ इट्स अ काइंड ऑफ अ कार्टोग्राफिक प्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ अ प्लेस और अ प्लेस दैट इट टॉक्स अबाउट नाउ by bringing together multiple authors including multiple genres and disciplines the geopolitism plans out a number of different points of view allowing diverse perspective to flesh out theek hai so it always geopolitism try to bring in multiple uh, outlooks multiple viewpoints to look at a character lo- uh, look at a place or the action taking place in that specific place and the character which are involved in the actions or how they are connected to those places it helps the reader to feel or have an experience a kind of first hand experience while reading or watching them now what are the key points there are some uh, key points which we all should keep in mind uh, about geopolitism the first one is uh, is multifocalism yeah multifocalization now what is multifocalization there is no any particular or specific view a, a, a any kind of study every kind of study every kind of uh, uh, study of space requires uh, different angles or uh, uh, different ways of looking at it no every character for example you take uh, you take out a novel uh, a modernist novel or you, you you just read while reading the novels of arki narayan you see that the same place where the action place uh, takes place for example the malgudi every character every story that are uh, set in malgudi by rk narayan each and every character has their own view their own problem their own issue their own setup about the place their own view so multifocalism is something that geopolitism focus upon okay how these geo uh, geographical features how this multi uh, uh, vision of a place help in creating the place or to map the place more coherently and more informatively to the readers this is what uh, geopolitism is uh, uh, more concerned about that is multifocalization second we can see here uh, what it uh, it deals with is uh, polysensuality now what is polysensuality space is not textually constructed by vision alone but also by other senses we all know that space is not just what we see what we observe or it is also something that we feel for example our house though we live in a, a, a four wall space a place which we call as house the wall that we have the wall we share with may, maybe with our neighbor but the house the internal space that we use that that we call as our house has its own importance to us it has a uh, various senses it has various means to us so it is not just vision uh, you know uh, uh, it's not a space is not only concern uh, it's not just concerned with the uh, vision or how it looks how beautiful uh, it looks how ugly it looks but it also concerned with other senses some places you uh, you feel relaxed for example when we visit a new place many of us may not be relaxed may, uh, no many of us do not feel very familiar or could not find ease it takes some time to get into familiarity with it to uh, to uh, to uh, to adopt that uh, that place or space that you are just now got into so a place is not a mono sensory uh, thing it has whole sensuality it's not only connected with your vision it has uh, every place has some impact has some importance has some thing to do with your other senses as well so every uh, space as the geopolitism uh, claims that it is poly it has poly sensuality now what the other point uh, geopolitism makes is a sta- uh, stratigraphic vision no what is it what is stratigraphic vision a certain literary space appeals to other texts from the past special symbolism and interpretation evolve over time we all know that uh, you know it's not like you know one place or one space is dealt or discussed by one person or one writer alone like ts eliot tradition uh, even a, a, every uh, writing or every place may have or not every but 
most of the places have produced multiple books multiple impacts and multiple uh, things influences on writers london is not the only place uh, 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 you know it's not the you know uh, some someone like shakespeare is not the only writer who talked about uh, who, uh, who who speak uh, uh, speaks about london its people its environment there are many writers there are many people uh, bombay is not the only uh, you know few writers like uh, uh, kk n daruwala he is not the only writer who uh, who talks about mumbai or bombay there are many writers who also talks about the same place so while reading all these writers definitely we will come across and we will understand the various views and various uh, uh, cultural you may say traditional or uh, the physiology or the uh, the physical presence of this place so it ha- it is geographical approach can give a static graphic vision of a place it's not limited to one viewpoint it's a kind of a traditional approach where while reading various for example like you know when we read the uh, poems and uh, stories of 1950s 60s of bombay or any other uh, 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 city you may take example you may pictureize you, while reading them you can pictureize the kind of uh, environment the kind of space that bombay had or the kind of environment bombay had during that uh, during that period so this approach geocritism helps us to create a kind of uh, a, a kind of what you can say a tradition a kind of uh, a, 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 a kind of continuation from past till present now the fourth one which is very much uh, concerned with geocritism is intertextuality of course how one space or one place or one geographical aspect or one ge- one geographical entity is presented maybe in various books maybe in uh, literature as well as in painting li- literature as well as in cinema or in a, a in any form of art is a city or, or or a place is not limited to literature alone you can see there is inter, there can be intertextuality there is definitely there is intertextuality uh, when we take any space into uh, into consideration not only literature talks about a specific uh, uh, place even other art like painting some exa- for example cinema for example also talk, talks about the same place so this intertextuality is also a concern is also an important aspect which helps the readers which helps the critic to understand the space the geographical a- aspects of that uh, a specific area or specific uh, place that uh, the writer or the uh, the presenter talks about now what is space and why does it matter of course as i told in the beginning every space matters it may be it may matters personally it may matter professionally it may matter emotionally it may matter in any way for example while walking through a uh, graveyard for example just for example okay uh, if suppose you have someone there you have buried someone there some for example so that you have a very you may have a emotional connection with the graveyard but on the uh, on the other hand if someone else is uh, uh, with you or or passing along with you if he doesn't have anybody who is living there who is just buried over there he may not have the same feeling that you may have toward that space so every space matters and why does uh, and why does it matter we'll see space is not just something objective around us it participate it participate in every action space participate place participate the geographical aspect that surrounds us participates in every action even uh, in our health also the space matters just for an example right when the weather changes when the place changes our physiological or uh, our health also changes to uh, to some extent and it takes some time to to actually get adjusted you know get familiar with those uh, with those uh, atmosphere and that's why it can be said that space is not a uh, uh, what you can say uh, is not something just passive it is active which participate to a greater extent so what henry warf and aris says in his book uh, in their book the spe- the special turn interdisciplinary perspective he uh, they says 
geography matters not for the simplistic and overly used reason that everything happens in space but because where things happen it's critical to know uh, to knowing how and why they happen of course we know we, we are not uh, concerned about for example uh, while reading a newspaper while reading a news we, we don't just read the news or the action or the incident that happened over there we also read about why it happened and how it happened so space is not an uh, passive entity it participates right we you know we also see that some uh, 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 places are defined by the actions or by the uh, people or by the kind of uh, uh, you know atmosphere it provides maybe very uh, familiar atmosphere some may, uh, maybe very reserved kind of atmosphere some places are there which we which we don't uh, uh, like to visit which we don't like people known to us or our family members to visit so it matters space does matter geography does matter as i told you in the uh, uh, in the previous period geography was not very much uh, uh, you know cons i mean uh, the uh, literary fellows or literary or the researchers are, are not very much keen towards uh, uh, looking at geography as a matter of importance for literature but now it has become you know uh, after 60s as i told you it has become a very very important entity of research uh, which has given out a lot of new ways of understanding a place and space and whatever action that takes place in that specific geographical area all right so what is space simply defining what is space you all i know must have the idea what is space is all about now space is a concept that encompasses the universe of course space is not a physical thing something that is physical space for example uh, it's a vacuum entity uh, something you cannot feel something you cannot experience but it is there it is a concept that encompasses the the universe it is infinitely large or reduced to a infinitely small which is itself infinitely and infinitely vast it can be so vast and at the same time it can be so microscopically minute as it says so how a space no it, it depends on the human beings or the animals what or the character no for example uh, if you talk about uh, the characters in novel and you know, how a space matters to them it, uh, it depends on how they take it what kind of action they involve in what kind of uh, 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 you know uh, features they need for the development so these things also matters when it comes to space the concept of space time has emerged and evolved since renaissance we all know that you know in the previous time a time is given more, uh, was given more importance before the renaissance period or even till the 19th and 20th century but recently when uh, the spatial studies has emerged and developed the the, uh, the uh, importance towards space has also evolved and uh, it, the space geography and place also garnering or receiving the important that it has never been experienced in the olden or, or in, in, in the previous period okay now we'll just uh, now literary cartography i just uh, we just talk about it map making how literature how writings can be a kind of map a kind of cartography now Pro robert tally a renowned critic uh, the current uh, who uh, uh, from te uh, texas he talks about uh, he has drawn his ideas from west falls the theory of geopolitism where he has introduced a concept called as literary cartography like map re reading a map okay we know that uh, you know while reading a globe while what does map do why we use map while going somewhere we all have the habit of using google map this map help us to reach to a specific place without asking without getting here or there so in this way reading good books according to him uh, authors create authors are like map makers and critics are like map readers every author every writer when he or she writes something he creates a map he or she creates a map of the place that he or or map of the place where he, uh, he his action his story takes place so when a reader reads it he can uh, he may be like a cartographer who is uh, who is a reader of map who is actually trying to understand the map 
understand the place or the geographical aspects that is connected or that the author or the critic is trying or or even the character is trying to present through the throughout the story now he also use here the term as i told you the literary uh, cartography to describe different ways that writers use to map social spaces now of course social spaces what is uh, so, uh, social spaces then we know some spaces are reserved we uh, for example take for example our own home our own house we have a specific definition of our the of the spaces that we have uh, in our houses in our house for example the kitchen is a space that is dedicated to women the hall or, or or the drawing room where the man sits even the bedroom has a specific definition when it comes to social uh, uh, you know the definitions so every space that we occupy or we enter into has some specific meaning has some uh, specific definition every space is not common right so spaces can be used for mapping or it can be used to understand to some extent to understand the social uh, setup as well so that's why he says that literary uh, cartography is highly helpful in describing different ways or to map social spaces all right now we all know as i uh, as uh, while going through the spatial studies you will come to know you must be knowing that uh, spatial studies is a truly interdisciplinary field it's not it's not only restricted to literature alone you can find the same kind of approaches in philosophy urban studies architecture anthropology physics geography and all those uh, areas which is uh, uh, which are of course Uh, you know a concerned with geography they all have some touch or some uh, elements of uh, a space in them of course geography is the primary uh, a study which has uh, developed and evolved about the space even physics even anthropology by studying anthropology also so all this uh, area to so it may be rightly said that spatial studies is not uh, uh, monodisciplinary it is inter and multidisciplinary as well right for uh, to understand the space not only reading literature will help you but while reading geography while reading anthropology or by reading physics as well you we will definitely understand the space in a more minute way that's why spatial studies can be considered as an interdisciplinary field now spatial then we just see the overview how and from where the importance of uh, a space or a geocritism or a geocritical approach has got its importance for uh, importance from geopolitics the term which is very common nowadays geographical politics and how you can take many examples of uh, in the middle east whatever happening in middle east right, uh, right now or in the last 10 years 20 years whatever happened then though all, all those actions all those incidents can be enveloped or uh, brought into the geopolitics now what is geopolitics it's a reconfiguration of territorial borders after world war 2 we know that before world war 2 there were many uh, uh, you know uh, uh, countries occupied by the colo you know colonial uh, there were many co countries occupied by the britishers and even many european countries so after uh, second world war as we all know these countries were left away. they were uh, given freedom they were uh, just uh, released from the control of the uh, colonial powers so after uh, world war 2 there is a relocation or a reconfiguration of uh, territorial borders happened take for example india which was the uh, single country before 1947 it was divided into three uh, different divisions pakistan east pakistan and west pakistan then india then later on while Uh, whatever happened we all know that so reconfiguration of uh, uh, borders happened after world war 2 especially the creation of uh, israel and the the problems of palestine all those things had only happened after the uh, second world war so geopolitics you may say that the importance of space the importance of spatial uh, what is critical approaches or uh, spatial turn has uh, 
found its way found its root after the world war 2 where the relocation reconfiguration reassignments of space took place recently we uh, we saw the the war in sri lanka that was also a geopolitical war where uh, a ltte you know uh, tamil liberation army and uh, the the sri lankan military were in constant struggle and constant fight for many years so that was also a kind of geo geopolitical war geopolitical uh, you know uh, what you can say a uh, geopolitical uh, uh, problem that we have recently uh, experienced and uh, it has concluded though in 2009 but still it can be said that special turn had actually uh, got its uh, uh, mileage and its importance only after the world war 2 now globalization the second important uh, thing which has uh, uh, reduced the distances between spaces distance between places and uh, we now experience the globalization ha has now uh, given out the collapse of spatial barriers the space time compression where you know now it is uh, too much easier for us to travel from one place to another place one space to another place even uh, we can travel from the earth from this space to the universe i mean uh, other space around us so it has you know the Uh, this globalization or the advent of new technological uh, or the development of new technology has actually reduced the distance between places distance between spaces as well as it has compressed the space time barrier spatial barriers are also collapsed so it uh, like harvey said in his book so globalization can be considered as a reason why the a uh, special crunch you may say was the important space or place has actually improved or developed right so we see today mncs and bpos acting or working in various countries so this has actually compressed the distance between spaces or places as well so globalization can also be a very important aspect very important influence on a special turn or special studies and if you twist it and come across then uh, come to see that you, you will experience that there are many uh, globalized uh, many uh, uh, perspective through which uh, uh, globalization can, uh, has actually helped to look at various spaces in a um, uh, in multifocal way now also the other factor that had actually uh, helped in developing special turn is the movement that may be called as mass migration tourism or traveling this has also actually collapsed or decreased the distance or the barrier between spaces mass migration may be because of any reason for example diaspora uh, diaspora literature is a production of migration or immigration to some extent tourism and traveling all these things are happening all these things had actually collapsed had actually reduced the difference between spaces and places as well so even the virtual spaces like media and cyber space has also uh, given a new kind of definition of uh, uh, to space and place even to geography now you know that there are many more, you know youngsters and there are many people amongst us who are more happy to live in the virtual world in the cyber space we create our identity We, we create our presence we create our friends our family our actions we limit ourselves to the cyber self itself so we are living in a uh, in an environment in as in an era where virtual space has become more important than the actual space this is very common when it comes to our family you know when it uh, comes to our personal experiences we all know that when we are at home right at this time also how easily we are connected the cyber space the virtual space has actually made this happen made this uh, webinar to happen we all are at different places sitting at uh, sitting at uh, different uh, what you can say cyber equipments different uh, environment and we are talking and we are just li listening to each other we are sharing our experiences with each other so virtual space has actually uh, compressed the difference between spaces you know usually before one year you may say or before few months when the uh, when seminars on uh, conferences used to be conducted 
we need to travel to some spe uh, uh, that specific college or the place to present our paper to present our uh, you know to just participate in those uh, seminars or webinars but now you know what happened now uh, because of this covid 19 impact everything is happening from wherever it is the people are connected from various places they are on a same platform by using a single platform they are connected they are talking they are discussing they are sharing their views their ideas so virtual space has also constrained it had actually compressed the spaces it had made uh, the geographical how do you can say the uh, geographical differences the geographical distances easier it has compressed the geographical distances so it, you know all thanks to these virtual spaces and uh, cyberspace and, and these medias where we today are able to uh, discuss on this kind of uh, uh, topics on this kind of platform so places are no longer clear support to our identity true it is not uh, you know for example many of us are migrants i am from kerala i i i was born there but later i came over here i did my studies here my schooling my graduation my pg my research my PhD, everything here so my identity is now uh, now my identity is not now connected or you know it's not limited it's not directly connected with kerala where i was born now it is directly connected with the place where i am working in now where i am uh, where i have completed my studies now so places have no longer clear support over identity for example if i say just by you know in the previous time we used to uh, you know uh, identify a person by the name for example a south in the, the name the surname itself indicate that the person belongs to south india but this because of migration because of uh, globalization you cannot say that a person may be may only be connected or related to a specific place or or place or space so geographical only places are no longer a clear support of our, of our identity we need to have more things multiple things to define our identity all right so as i told you place has become not only the physical place or the geographical place even the cyberspace or the media is also responsible for this uh, compression of space all right so the key ideas just we we'll just go through the key ideas which has uh, propounded by the uh, by various uh, critics and the philosophers about the space he and Henry Lefebvre, in his book, The Production of Space, he says, Space matters. Space is never neutral or innocent. It is produced by society through complex subjective relations between who is perceiving it and how it is, uh, how it is used and surveyed. The postmodern critic, then he where he talks about space, according to him, space is not at all neutral. It's not a passive uh, pub participant but it's an active participant it is not innocent it has it has subjective impact it has complex subjective role to play in 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 our life in the uh, in the life that we live in in the life that uh, uh, in our the social existence you may say in our cultural existence as well so space has its own importance it is not at all it's never neutral it's never innocent it takes place in our activities or you know, it directly involved in our uh, you know life as well the special term key ideas according you know we just see some few uh, key ideas about the special term here michael foucault what he says in space and power his book he says a whole history remains to be written of spaces as I told you, as we all know, space was not given the sort of importance it required to be given in the uh, in the uh, in the previous period, previous time. The critics were concerned with the time, with the characters, or uh, with other environmental aspects which uh, actually help in creating the plot or theme. Space was not given as important as uh, as much important as it should have received, but these critics like Foucault and many others they have actually given uh, they have actually tried to bring space to the fore, uh, to, uh, to the foreground then from uh, then from being in the background so that's why he says the the present epoch 
will perhaps be above all epoch of space right so now we are not only concerned with the uh, time only even the space does matter he says it in of other spaces his book uh, of, of other spaces in 1967 which was published in so he also talks about a very interesting concept uh, of his in the same book heterotopia so what is heterotopia you all must be knowing that a place that society allocates to individual in, in the state of crisis may be for example you know like some uh, some uh, pictures i have shared here during this uh, the war that the wars in fact that are taking place in middle east we know there are many people who have migrated from syria from iraq to various european countries and they were put in some uh, some uh, camps where they are living where they are dwelling where they are trying to struggle out and figure out their 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 future plans so heterotopias are usually the places that uh, you know society allocates to individual for example if somebody you know if uh, a criminal for example a person who has committed any crime society demands that person to be put in a jail the society will never allow the same person to roam in uh, in the uh, in the normal social spaces because we feel a kind of terror a, a, a kind of fear from that person and for that reason we want that person to be in jail and we believe the people believe that while uh, you know after spending some time in jail the person may get his behavior may get developed and he will be you know a cleansed man here his all uh, crime will be diluted and get away that doesn't happen for example someone who is not normal mentally not normal we have a, a you know mental asylum for them so in this way there are many spaces and places which are predefined by society like take for example a city a city is also di uh, uh, divided into various segments for example who live where where to live for example a person for you know there are many cities there are many places which are defined by caste right a place may have varied division one play, uh, there may be a specific space where a specific caste or specific people lives there may be some other um, other place or space where some other caste some other place some some uh, not only caste but but class of people live so they never like others to come into their their uh, their their places or space and they don't like themselves to go into other uh, other places or other spaces so this uh, that's why he uh, define heterotopias are the place that society allocate to individual in the state of crisis okay so every single culture may have some heterotopia they evolve according to the particular socio historical context as per the need as per the requirement these heterotopias are created by society by by some uh, you know the the people who define society who who, who actually has the right not the right but has the that the impact or that kind of uh, influence to define a space or place all right so this is what he talks about i mean of course i, I won't go in depth into it just a brief outline of heterotopia i just wanted to give over here see again now we also talk uh, 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 it is also a very uh, interesting book by gash and bestler the poetics of space where he talks about uh, the impact of spaces and geography on our personal life and how they impact us how they has a, a, its uh, 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 various effect on our uh, day to day or our personal and professional life as well so he talks about uh, topophilia the love of place indicating an emotional link to space of course as i told you in the beginning every space has some emotional or some personal connection to us that he defines as topophilia okay for example i like the chair i sit in we all like to uh, have a specific place for us uh, while dining you may have your your place to sit where you where every time every day you want to sit you like to sit at that place if some day someone else sits you know when for example some a guest came in so you feel a kind of uncomfortable you you may feel un, you know feel uh, un, uncomfortable to adjust with the uh, with other place that's why he says that we all develop a love and emotion towards a space that we are connected to so also he says space is never empty or homogeneous we live spaces there is always a subject who 
is affected by space experiences and reacts to space feels space through existential living conditions mood and atmosphere so space is never empty or homogeneous we all know that uh, every space is occupied by some by something it may be you know if there is a free space that may be occupied by things that we don't know that we can't see that we can't experience that may be some uh, uh, anything that we don't actually know so these spaces must have some occupancy there is no space which is empty we all know that when the scientists are studying in the outer space they also experience there are some terrestrial extra terrestrial things there defined as it may be called as a satellites or whatsoever so every space is occupied by something it may be human beings it may be a, a, a other animals it may be non living things maybe so space spaces are occupied they are never empty and these spaces are always subjected to who is affected by the space or in turn affects the space experiences and reacts to space of course feel space through existential living conditions mood and atmosphere all right this is what uh, uh, he talks about it's a very very uh, uh, very wonderful book lengthy as well but it has a lot of informative aspects in there now space and intimacy we know that intimacy we don't share our intimacy we don't share our personal uh, uh, what you can say uh, feelings or uh, uh, emotional attachment we don't share our emotional attachment to every every place or space for example your professional space you may not be so much in, uh, emotionally attached towards it so much personally attached towards it but our personal space maybe your home maybe your native place maybe the place where you uh, where you spent your childhood where the school where you uh, had wonderful memories of your childhood the ground where the place so these places are the space of in, uh, intimacy where you are intimately connected to them the so cartography of the intimate key studies of space as a site of human intimacy and desire and desires related to space so there is also a kind of uh, cartographic study of intimate space as well when we can connect various spaces how we have evolved from those spaces how we are connected to those those places even now i i am i am pretty sure that uh, if you are not from yes suppose if right now if you are not at your na native place or the place where you have spent your childhood you definitely would like to be there at least once in a year so that you can recall whatever you did in, in your childhood on the lap of the mother where the, where the, where the child grew up that has a very 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 a uh, close connection to us the womb where the the child grows up right so these are spaces they can be defined as uh, spaces where which are very much intimately connected to us we can't be away from there we, we can't just avoid them no matter what happens so these spaces are very much uh, intimately connected to us the house for example as i told you a starting point of our relationship uh, to the universe now that that is a place that is a space where uh, there is a geographical area geographical aspect from where our relationship to the universe starts wherever you go whichever pl place you visit at the end of the day at the end of the tour you want to be back to your houses your your, your home where your family dwells where lives so you cannot be away you cannot live in a way in a hotel for lifetime we all strive to have our own house if you are living in a rented apartment you always desire to have a uh, have your own house a house has a very very intimate uh, connection to us because uh, our emotions our feelings and many things have connect, are connected to it, connected to it that's why a house has a very intimate a very intimate connection to us to, towards our life a site to fill develop imagination related to closely to the intricate mechanisms of human memory and identity formation of course we form our identity uh, we form our uh, memory we develop our memory uh, uh, from the house we live in or we we spent our childhood uh, childhood in so you know usually these uh, uh, places the houses the the veranda you may say or the courtyard where we have uh, we played our childhood out so these places had very intimate connection to our memory towards our memory and also towards uh, uh, things that we uh, you know any anything that is uh, typically connected to our uh, to our emotions or sentiments 
Shelter is also a thing uh, as one of the main principles. The house to develop identity and imagination, the attic, the cellar, the drawer, the corner, the closet, even all these things. So for for example, house, uh, jo, uh, no, the thing that we have in our house, the attic, the cellar, the drawer, the balcony, the corner, the closet, everything, every specific space of a house has something to do with us. Has something to do with our intimate, uh, our memory. No, we, you know. Uh, you have spent your time in the courtyard maybe in the balcony maybe so these all spaces you like to be there you know there you connect a kind of emotional attachment towards it you you connect a, a, a kind of intimate uh, intimacy towards it so every corner every nooks and corner of a house every kind of space every space of a house has some intimacy has some intimate connection towards our emotions towards our sentiment towards our imagination towards our things that we consider uh, you know anything that we consider to be ours the concept of intimate uh, immensity the dialectical of the big and the small houses and shells for example a intimate immensity of course there are some places places where we have immensely intimate to us right you may imagine whatever those, those places are i don't i, I will not uh, just uh, Talk about, but you can you uh, can imagine immensely intimate, right? Where, of course, you must have imagined what I mean to say. So these spaces and these places are immensely connected to our uh, personal and emotional grounds, uh, emotional uh, you know things like. Now, who else? Who better can define? You know. Uh, intimate space than Virginia Woolf in in her room of one's own. You must, you all must have read it, read the book. At least you all must know about the book, where she talks about we, you know, the space for women, why she needs space, and what kind of space she desires to have. The room represents the state of exclusion from the educational institutions and the financial power, and claims need of reaffirmation of women within the literary scene. So you all know, uh, she talks about a woman should have her own room where she can think, where she can uh, imagine, where uh, which gives her own space, which gives her, uh, her uh, intimacy, a freedom from other spaces, which is not very common uh, in our social setup, right? A woman do not have a specific space to live or dwell in. Ah, the kitchen, as I told you in the beginning, the kitchen may be defined as a space of women, but that space that doesn't provide the kind of intimacy, the kind, kind of freedom that a woman desires to have. So, as uh, Virginia Woolf says, uh, uh, said in her book, a woman should have some space, some place where she can be alone with herself, she can be with herself only, where nobody to there to disturb her. So, we you know, uh, especially when we talk about space. We are uh, primarily concerned about the space occupied by the men. We don't talk about the space, or, or you know, which is uh, occupied, which are occupied by women, or which the woman desires to have. Right? Social spaces, as I, uh, as we have seen in the uh, pre uh, previous slide, social spaces. Who defines social space? Social spaces are defined by men only. Men alone. It's. It's a. It's a kind of. Uh, you know, uh, so should you use even the space of women are de are, are are defined by men. There are only few men who would like to uh, spend some time in kitchen. Maybe there, are maybe many who have spent their time uh, in kitchen during the lockdown. Even now, some. But there are, you know, apart from this, there are only few men who like to be in kitchen, like to share the space with women. Otherwise, what the what we do, what the communists, uh, you know, most of the men do, they just say, uh, sit in the drawing room call for water uh, uh, demand for water or whatsoever and the woman who is working already in the kitchen she just comes out with whatever you have demanded so you don't there are people who don't there are men who don't even like to enter those places which are specifically defined to a woman so that's why uh Virginia Woolf's claim that a woman should have her own space her own place is rightly a good claim that should be given a priority, should be given importance too, even in the Indian social context. Right. So, liminality and rights of passages, non-place is a very uh, new concept. 
you may say uh, where mark aujing had talks about non places of course as i told you whatever spaces we have discussed till then they all are connected to us they all are connected to our personal emotions our, our emotions our uh, personal feelings you may say or our uh, intimate uh, memories and as well but there are some places which we call which uh, can be called as non places which are open to all for example when we visit a railway station there is not uh, that space is not uh, uh, specifically assigned to someone you visit a mall shopping mall and airport maybe or aircraft maybe you, the, the seat may be reserved for you but the aircraft is not so these places can be called as non places where you know where uh, the the that specific place is not defined is not assigned to a person but it is open to all we know that there are you know most of us visit shopping malls yeah the youngsters especially they all, they like to be they like to visit shopping mall but do they go for shopping only only few may may spend their money spend their time in shopping but most of them spend their time in uh, in in the food court or uh, just roaming throughout the shop, 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 shopping complex because there is no specific definition of these places and hence these places can be called as non places where there is no specific definition there is no specific, specific authority there is no uh, specific uh, what o- occupation for example even the seat you uh, use it while traveling through train while tra- traveling to aircraft you may have reserved the seat for that journey only once you get out of there uh, uh, well, once you deboard the train or deboard the uh, the aircraft the say same place the same seat the space the same space may be occupied by some other traveler some other flyer so these are not uh, you know these uh, hence these kind of places can be called as non places as mark hauser defined in his book non places all right so now it comes to how uh, geography space and li- literature are connected or a geocritical approach towards literature we'll come to asian literature later on i'll just give some uh, uh, brief outline about uh, how can we uh, analyze by using ge- geographical or uh, spatial studies uh, these literary books or the uh, these fictional books okay geographer bani warf and center are state in the introduction of their resourceful book on space and geography entitled the spatial turn 2008 geography matters not for the simplistic and overly used reason that everything happens in space but because where things happen is critical to critical knowing why and how they happen just just now we have seen they define in their book the spatial turn that geography does matter not just because to know where things happen but it also help us to know in detail why and how happened a reporter need to visit the place where an incident happened to understand to study how and why happened he or she cannot be at the you uh, know uh, 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 at his newspaper or newsroom without visiting they cannot get the actual happening or uh, uh, actual uh, why and how behind the incident so geography does matters because it's not just uh, uh, a space or a place that defines where happened but by to know why and how it happened you need to know the place as well space is not passive in a sense as we have just uh, uh, discussed it participate in every action it matters because it participate in every human act it contrasts to what is typically and generally portrayed as a as in this space is a passive back to human life of course not passive when we study in a, in a, a, you know deeply you will realize that these places are not passive but it has very active impact active use and active presence in our life like for example like uh, in the uh, in the works of henry lefebvre and michael foucault like we have seen they have given importance to space in the marxist social theory so we just we don't go into it very deep no now it's not as i told you geography and the concept of space is not a new thing even plato had his own idea about space which was like uh, other uh, concept of uh, uh, plato the same was refuted and uh, 
uh, uh, you know what you can say, uh, defended by Plato because uh, to uh, to uh, so defended by Aristotle, Plato uh, had a, a different concept, a conception about space where he had thought he had uh, uh, believed that uh, space is a, a receptacle or a passive vessel in where the whole creation takes place. Even place is created out of space, according to him, at, the, at a lesser important level as compared to space by Plato. This was defined by uh, Aristotle in physics, where he has actually uh, objected to this view of Plato, where, where he has given uh, equal interest and equal importance to place as well. So it's not a new phenomenon, as I told you. But the thing is that literary uh, researchers and writers have started to give importance to space, place, and geography in the recent, maybe in the last 30, 40 years only. Even for Descartes, like Aristotle, he also says that physical place is closely related to the space that it occupies. It's a, you know, like Cartesian theory also, uh, you know, talks about internal and external place, like Aristotle talks about the place. So what is internal space and external space? Like as I told, as you know, internal place is absolute. For example, the space we occupy, the place where I'm sitting or the internal space means my organs in turn uh, the, the the organ that 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 my body contains may be called as internal space or the space of your home it is absolute of course but it has correspondence with the external space as well all right so external uh, place is a relation and is equated to the space between body and the azure object for example i am sitting here and one person is sitting next to me we are related because of the space or the place that we share between us. Kant, but somehow Kant refutes Descartes this point of view by making, by claiming that uh, space is uh, nothing but in nature of mind. Space is uh, neither an endlessly extended container nor it is formed in the relation of existing object, but it is subjective, issuing by the constant law from the nature of the mind for the coordinating of all outer senses. He has a different view about space. According to a space, he is not a physical entity. It is a mental mental action or mental entity. It has nothing to do with your uh, physics. But you know, these are uh, not so much uh, concerned. We, are, we should not be very, very much concerned about these views, as far as literature is concerned. Michael Foucault, as I told you, he has uh, he has also discussed about uh, various spaces, Marxist from the Marxist point of view, and how these spaces are uh, important when it comes to define, uh, you know, a, 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 a person's social appearance, social importance, even to some extent the literary pro, you know, production as well. All right, so one of the important thing he talks about in his book, Discipline and Punishes Panopticism. You you all must be knowing about it, where like for example, on the right, on the uh, on the bottom, uh, on the bottom right, you can see uh, the picture of Panopticon. It's a kind of place which are developed by. Uh, it's a kind of jail. It's a kind of place which is which is developed to observe people. A kind of jail where there will be a, a central place where the watchman or watch fellow can stand and watch whatever happening around uh, the, around him or her. So now this is what happens. Of course, you know, we all are under surveillance. You can you see that we are not uh, in surveillance panopticon, which is defined by Foucault at that time, we are facing today. We all are using smartphones, we all are using internet, we all are have, we all have uh, CCTV cameras, you know, or, you know, we all are under surveillance. Nothing, though we are sharing some of uh, our information, it may be claimed that end to end encryption are there, whatever, but there is no guarantee that we are not in surveillance. Like in jail, there may be a watchman, a person who is watching the inmates at the same way in the modern time, even we are, though we looks to be free, though we feel to be free, move, moving freely around, but somewhere, somehow, we also know that we are also under surveillance. Having a, a smartphone makes you easily accessible by others to know where you are, what are you doing, what are your personal information and all things. And we are very much keen to posting them, posting them in our social media platforms. So 
panopticon which is a concept which he had, he had uh, uh, defined there to to define about discipline and punishment the kind of all those things even today it is highly relevant when it comes to our personal uh, you know our own modern life that we live in the smart life that we live in by using the smartphones all right so even michael search the spanish geographer he also talked about various geographical aspects in his book the practice of everyday life where he uh, where he talk, uh, talks about uh, that uh, uh, space uh, we create space by daily actions Uh, and it's a human a uh, agency. According to him, uh, we create space by using tactics and strategies. For example, a, a fatty worker. Okay, workers. We all know that when there is no supervisor on us, or where, where is no principal. If suppose we are in college and there is no principal, somewhere we feel free to do whatever we want to do. The the same happens in factory when there is no supervisor who is looking after the work of the employees. of the workers the workers feel free and uh, they may create their own entertainment they they, they, they may spend uh, they may feel uh, in a free space at that time so strategies are also a very important thing you know tactics and strategies are used by especially by those people uh, by those community who are not given who, are, who don't receive their uh, their uh, deserving space they use strategies and tactics to achieve those space in group by group or whatever means they can adopt to so in this way you know space has uh, various ways of uh, you know what you can say uh, ad uh, to uh, achieve them to uh, to have them in uh, with you now as i told uh, as we have discussed so we don't go into it again like uh, best and best of the poetic so uh, poetic space you can read it it is easily available on the net as well but it's a wonderful book that it defines about the minute particles the minute things in our house and how we are connected emotionally uh, uh, psychologically you may say personal towards them okay henry lefebvre you all, you, you you all must be knowing that the marxist theories the modern theories he also talk, uh, talks about uh, uh a space he talks about uh, he according to him space is not uh, uh, neutral because it is ideological form every, according to him every space since he is a marxist theorist uh, uh, to him every space is ideologically formed created they have their own uh, they serve some hegemonic they are used as a tool by some uh, some hegemonic powers right to uh, it is you may be uh, you you may say yeah yeah, yeah he is uh, absolutely right to some action where he tells that uh, where uh, where he claims that these places are uh, the tools uh, which uh, serve to the purpose of uh, hegemonic powers right defining uh, as it uh, uh, as we have uh, discussed earlier a city is divided according to the power according to the financial power according to the class na the level of classes so places and spaces are not neutral according to him they serve for the agenda for the purpose of hegemonic powers so it's a purely marxist point of view here he, uh, uh, discuss here and there are many theories like david harvey edward soya even they also talks about uh, various spaces various geographical entities and uh, how these entities and material practices and uh, how they are connected towards each other and all those things so i think uh, we won't go so deep into it because we are already almost 130 now so even geocritism the first book as i told you uh, uh, the produced by uh, uh, written by burton westfall he also taught uh, talks about geocritism in depth geographer doran messi uh, uh, in her book space place and gender also to uh, talks about how gender gendered spaces you may say how spaces are, are gender defined by by gender the space for women space for man or whatever so these all uh, these all theorist has actually given a vast area a vast uh, uh, information or vast inputs into the study of geocritical analysis or geocritical studies so <laughs> even 
writers like Cat Millet, uh, even uh, many others like Jillian Rose, even they have uh, defined feministic spaces. Now, of course, uh, of course, uh, when it comes from female writers, when it comes from feminists, of course, they definitely uh, they are uh, more interestingly talks about the feministic spaces. So they also talks about the other space, the other the feminine space, how it, uh, it is defined, how it could be defined, and what are the elements of this feminine space. Now those spaces are defined by these writers. Or if someone is interested in the research in spatial studies or geopolitical studies, these writers can be of extremely very, very, very useful, very, very helpful for them to analyze the text or, or, or to do the research. Now, uh, apart from this, let us just see uh, some common uh, spaces that uh, or common geographical uh, spaces that we encounter, feminine spaces. Now, what is feminine spaces? Usually, we know that the space, uh, familial roles are gendered, not only gendered, but defined by spaces as well. No, even the actions, uh, in, there are some specific and certain roles we define for female, for male, and uh, both of them never try or never want to be in the place of others. Or they don't, uh, especially the male don't want to be, in, uh, to, be to do the role of, uh, of female. So, familial roles are gendered, we know, but it is not only gendered roles, but they are also special ordering. The women's place in the family, particularly in the in a particular society, is constricted. We know they there are a lot of limitations we the patriarchal society put on the women where to sit, how to sit, where to go, how to go, how to work, with whom to work, where to stay. Uh, if, if someone comes in, if uh, uh, some guest comes in, the women are not supposed to sit in the uh, in the in the drawing room, they should be in the kitchen or maybe in the uh, in the bedroom or wherever out of sight. Simply telling. Okay, so even these places are uh, defined, or you know, even they are uh, uh, specially uh, gendered. These places are All right. The so family also uh, becomes a kind of imagined spaces to some extent, uh, who fantasizes new lives and new living spaces. An ideal family projects a model of equation where all members of the family, especially women, are considered to possess equal values and rights. But it's not very common. It's not very, very general in our society, especially. We don't uh, consider, we don't uh, try to give the uh, kind of equal uh, importance to uh, to the women that uh, the women mem members of our family. I have seen many family. Even you must have seen uh, many family where the man uh, sit on the sofa, on the chair, there is a specific chair for them, the women sit on the floor. And at night when the man is tired after coming back from office or, or from your job, the, uh, it's a duty of a woman to press the leg, give a uh, massage. But what happened? What about the woman who works throughout the day? Does man care? Does man give? Does man uh, do what she, uh, she does for him? Giving a short massage or just asking her, this doesn't happen. So, family space are also constructed, defined by this by so by society. There are specific roles which we expect from members of family to do, and we don't allow others to, or we don't uh, uh, actually expect others to, uh, you know, uh, you know, infiltrate. If I'm if I'm not wrong, in those spaces. Now we have ethnic spaces. Ethnicity is an important aspect when we geographically analyze the thing. Geographism in geographism, uh, ethnicity is also a very important aspect because while studying geography, you also or while uh, studying the uh, uh, history of human or uh, history of people, we cannot uh, stay away from the ethnicity. The history, maybe politics, neighborhood, media, all they contribute to a greater extent the formation of ethnic background or ethnic definition. So ethnic space also play a crucial role in construction of society as their key constituent of maintain the diverse society. To, to maintain diversity, to construct society in a proper way, ethnicity or ethnical or ethnic uh, space must be given importance. Also, cultural spaces, of course. Culture and how, what kind of spaces does culture uh, provides? What kind of uh, spaces uh, culture, uh, you know, uh, helps to pro uh, to to, uh, to create? These all are also very much uh, important for uh, very, very much of human concern. These uh, all these cultural elements can be uh, 
uh, used as a mark of identification all these cultural spaces can be used as a, a, a mark of culture definition as well or identity as well right so in, in this way cultural spaces are also uh, important to important aspect of uh, geopolitical analysis i won't go so much deep into it now come to the national spaces i'll just quickly go through the next of my slides because okay national spaces even the nation now the nation spaces uh, is not limited to a uh, few uh, community or few people you know the national space has uh, with the advent of globalization and all those things all those uh, you know the or even the migration has actually expanded and made the national spaces more more constrained now but also we all wherever we go wherever we live national spaces or the place where we come from the space where we welcome is constantly connected to our identity any an indian living in uh, europe or america will always be defined as an indian right so our identity if you are living in some other state or country our other countries are of course your identity is closely connected to your nation people call you people define you by the nation from you come from Okay, so this identify uh, this day the our nation defines our identity, and also it uh, it also provides an identity for of the uh, and the living space to a person who is born in there. So uh, if, uh, in that way, national spaces is also extremely important for uh, geo for for the geopolitical analysis. Now we'll just go through quickly some of the Asian writers and their major works. And the thematic overview of that person, how geopolitics can be uh, applied and can be a, a, a can be an approach to uh, to uh, uh, to study their works, to to have research on them. First of all, we'll talk about only few examples. There are many, but I just took randomly few examples here. If we talk about India, we we'll start with the uh, uh, with India, of course. When we talk about Asian literature. See, for example, the books of uh, uh, Zumpa Lahiri and Manju Kapoor, the Lowland and the Immigrant, they are extremely, extremely geocritical in approach. If you study their, uh, their works from a geocritical point of view, you, will, you can uh, see wonders. You can see how, uh, how uh, in-depth analysis can be done uh, from the geocritical perspective or point of view. Like uh, they have... Uh, there are examples of, uh, like in the lowland, there are examples of Naxalite movement, there are uh, examples of inequality and poverty, and how uh, the, the space of the, the struggle for uh, space that is uh, you know, shown through the Naxalite movement, how they fight against the government for, uh, to, 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 to keep their uh, spaces and place uh, safe from occupation and all those things. So if you read, Zumpa Lahiri is the lowland from the geocritical perspective. You can see how these spaces, within spaces are defined by the character, defined by her, and uh, where the character dwell in, even they also matters a lot while, while we read from the geocritical perspective. Even Immigrant by Manju Kapoor also talk, talks about how uh, you know uh, the character when she uh, immigrates to a new a new place how difficult it is for her to adjust with the, the the place the environment the the people around her and how she feel lonely and how she wants to how she remember and how she feel to come back so all those things can be a kind of can be analyzed through the geocritical perspective so these are wonderful presentation where you can uh, you know actually use geocritical perspective now also in the uh, uh, in the walls of delhi by uday prakash it is a compilation of three stories where the first story uh, talks about um, a sweeper who come across a block of money and escapes uh, with his uh, underage mistress to see uh, taj mahal there is another story uh, mohandas where the dalit races to reclaim his life was stolen by the upper caste and there is also a story uh, titled Mango silk, where the baby's head gets bigger and bigger as as he as he gets smarter and smarter. So even these, even this book can be studied from the geopolitical perspective. Okay. 
for example like uh, the the sweeper uh, the job that uh, that he did the money she gets and the the imagine the imagination and that that uh, desire to watch a place by, uh, which he never seen to see a place which he never seen that taj mahal so even this way this uh, uh, even this book can be analyzed from the geographical perspective if you read it you definitely will come across various more uh, you know uh, 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 markers geographical markers in there now neil mukherjee's a life apart is also talks about uh, it has a gay uh, protagonist which uh, talk, uh, talks about uh, post you know displacement territorial uh, occupations and the everyday gay life and uh, the space of gay the place for gay you know it's a very interesting uh, area to define i think there are not many works on it that how the space of gay how this gay population occupy this their space maybe in the family maybe in society social spaces uh, family spaces geographical spaces how they claim them how uh, people assign them specific spaces this is a new uh, this, this can be an area of study of course all right so now also like uh, ji tail's book uh, narcopolis where uh, he, uh, he talks about the bombay life the opium the freedom of uh, 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 you know the freedom here the, uh, the the film sex religion and everything is uh, uh, you know spoken by her uh, discussed by her by him uh, in narcopolis so when we read this book we can create a kind of imaginary or uh, or, or pic pic picture as the kind of concept of bombay though if someone of you may never been here never been to bombay but by after reading this book you can create a kind of atmosphere you can create a picture of the atmosphere a picture of uh, uh, the so the social structure the the physical structure here and how people live how what the cultures are so in this way a geographical or geographical aspects or geo geographical reading can also be uh, uh, this book also invites a geographical reading then of course the white tiger many of you know it is highly highly uh, you know it has many uh, aspects of geographical reading when where you can uh, uh, you know see how the the indian i mean uh, how india especially the 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 city is mumbai and all those places are defined and uh, uh, described by him i'm i'm very uh, uh, sometime i'm uh, I, 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 I feel very awkward to see that how uh, these. I mean, of course, they are great writers. I don't have any enmity or any kind of uh, negative to, uh, negativity towards them. But still, I'm not very uh, convinced with the way uh, sometimes some of our writers present India uh, in front. Uh, you know, in the in literature, wherein uh, just for the sake of uh, fame, just for the sake of uh, some recognition, you know, showing in the bad light. It's not something that. Uh, i don't agree with this my personal view i am not uh, 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 you know presenting i am not talking about on behalf of anybody else it's a personal view but but even though uh, coming to the geographical uh, perspective white tiger is a wonderful book which can be analyzed very well through the geographical perspective then we uh, after india when we see our neighbor book bhutan Though it uh, that uh, though the country is too small to and it it has no uh, very significant works uh, produced by them, but still uh, if you see the book by uh, if you read the book book by Alice and Wahiji, the headwind Lakshmi story, it talks about the Nepal Bhutan insurgency and how the insurgency and agony of uh, Nepali living as a refugee in, in Nepal and Bhutan, India, and how all these kind of uh, the, the the poem, exile poem by uh, Devi Subedi, even these uh, writings talks about the various issues, the insurgency issues maybe, and all those kind of issues that are, which may be connected to a geopolitical uh, or geopolitics or geo uh, no. Geographical point of uh, this can be analyzed to geographical geographical point of view as well. Of course, insurgency is a geographical phenomenon. It is a part of a geographical phenomenon, of course. Now, we'll have come to our other neighborhood, Bangladesh. If you see, uh, you know, this can be divided into two uh, categories: East Pakistan era and Bangladesh era. That means uh, 
uh, the books which were written be before 1971 and after 1971 when uh, when the Bangladesh was formed. Previously, as you all know, it was called as East Pakistan. So during that period, the the list of books I have given here. When you read these books, when, when you go across these books, they talks about language, communal violences, rural and urban issues, and how the uh, rural, uh, you know, when the people are, uh, uh, when when the uh, division happened, when the new 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 country was formed, and what are the political impact, geographical impact, and when they when people migrated from India, how they uh, how they felt difficulty in adjusting their their environment, all these things. Uh, these all writers are uh, you know they they talk about all these issues in the in their books here. When we talk about uh, Bangladesh here, and uh, for like uh, after 1971, all these books are. These are the primary writers and primary books. They talks about the liberation war, the impact of war on them, its consequences, hopeless human existence, and analysis of human mind society. These are the primary theme they deal with. Human existence, you know, like you know, economy was not that much developed when Pakistan, the uh, West Pakistan, which is currently the Pakistan, uh, left Bangladesh uh, or the Bangladesh when it got freedom from the Pakistan and. They had no uh, uh, stable e economy. They had a lot of problem with the uh, with their existence, with their daily. I mean, with their economy and all those things. But it took time for them to develop, and all those issues, this hopelessness of existence and uh, uh, consequence of war on them. These all uh, themes are basically defined and uh, discussed by them, by these writers. You know, uh, these uh, invite geocritical analysis, of course. You know, the partition and uh, the formation of new uh, new new countries, the impact of geology, uh, geographical uh, features uh, in the more geopolitical perspective can be applied on these writings as well. Even there is a book by the Amina Anam, the Good Muslim. It also talk about uh, you know uh, when uh, uh, when Bangladesh got freedom, how the women are raped, abused uh, during the war. Uh, during the partition, especially during the war by the Pakistani army, you may say, or all these things are discussed. Even that can be uh, a, a, a way of analysis, a, a, a kind of geocritical analysis, maybe applied here as well. Okay, so when you talk about Sri Lanka, there are many books like uh, Naomi Munavira's uh, Island of a Thousand Mirrors or uh, China Man by his name. Uh, you know, these. Uh, uh, Shahan Karuna Tilaka. These are books, or example, these books like Amulet Coming to Terms, Giraya, Amina Hussein's Zilich, or the diaspora writers like Chandani Loku Case, If the Moon Smiled, or Softly As I Leave You, Sham Selvadurai's Funny Boy, English Patient by Michael Antajit. These all writings, if you read, you can find enormous, enormous material of geocritical, you know, geocritical, enormous material of geocriticism. Where you can see when the character, the, the, for example, in uh, coming to terms, when the uh, character moves from Sri Lanka to Malaysia, and uh, how she feels, and when, when uh, after she uh, she comes back, for example, after ten years, when she comes back to Sri Lanka, and uh, what kind of things she observes, for example, when you read uh, Amina Hussein's uh, The Moon in the Water, it, uh, it talks about the character who uh, who moves from Geneva to Sri Lanka and who is forced to come back to Sri Lanka and how what kind of uh, difficulty she faces by for adjusting there. If you read If the Moon Smiled or so, uh, Softly As I Leave You by Chandani Dokuge, they both talks about both the books talk, talks about life of Sri Lankan in Australia and how uh, difficult it is for a Sri Lankan who is a South Asian uh, person, especially a woman, to adjust there, to uh, to adjust into a new country and live over there. So these uh, books are actually, uh, you know, has a lot of element of geo geo geopolitism. Now, uh, when we talk about Pakistan, home by H M Nakhvi, it talks about uh, uh, you you usually how. Uh, Nine after 9-11, how the perspective of uh, um, uh, Americans and uh, the Europeans changed towards uh, Muslims or South Asian uh, Muslims uh, especially. And it talks about the pitfalls and uh, the culture and uh, uh, or the Pakistani culture as well and how difficult they feel to be to, to get accepted 
in um, uh, in uh, in america and all europe it is maybe there is uh, some book by uh, mohsin like mohsin hamid's book how to get filthy rich in rising area where he talks about a imaginary south asian country where everything is fine G, uh, G, gdp can be pushed and south asian where uh, energy opportunity uh, is sizzling in imaginary town she talks about but somehow that can be compared to pakistan you know there is no direct difference but still that could be count, uh, compared to uh, pakistan uh, like uh, an utopia uh, he talks about in this book where various uh, e uh, economical development could take place which is not primarily seen in pakistan then there's also a book by jamil hamid the wandering falcon it also talks about the issues of uh, afghan pakistan border the tribes living there how they are constantly being harassed by uh, the pakistani army or some time by talibanis or some uh, some uh, such, such kind of anti or uh, terrorist organization no they all they are wonderful written books and you know, even you can apply geopolitical perspective on their these books as well even chinese books if you talk about china though there are no uh, first hand writing by uh, chinese in uh, many first hand writing by chinese chinese uh, people living in uh, chinese writers living in china but there are many books uh, there are many books available as translation from uh, uh, in, in english uh, no like for example uh, the vagrants by you uh, Yu Li and the uh, Ray Shorten by Moyon. These books uh, uh, talk, uh, talks about Chinese diaspora. The first book, the the Wagner talks about China's uh, Chinese diaspora and uh, uh, the the impact of communism, the impact of uh, democratic wall being created in 1984 whatsoever, and Beijing. All those things are very very uh, you know minutely defined in here. And uh, of course, Moyon who won the Nobel Prize in 2012. uh his book the red uh, shorgan talks about uh, uh, a family who has uh, you know become fighters who are actually uh, stand against the uh, revolution and all those things and and also talks about the changing relationship between china and japan the war and the you know what everything the the book talks about even there are books like the seventh day by you who are love in the fallen city by helen chang and the lost daughter of happiness by jelen yan even these books are wonderfully crafted and wonderfully talks about the geopolitical and other perspective if you read them somehow where you can bring in geopolitical aspects to their uh, to these books and their them and their stories indonesia though it is not very uh, very much interested area by the indians by all but uh, even there are some books by some writers like ayu utami saman a novel okay uh, it talks about the dictatorship uh, rule at that period and how the uh, uh, you know uh, horror of state violence uh, political repressions interrogation uh, and uh, taboos uh, on female sexuality and these all things are uh, uh, discussed by ayu utami uh, in uh, in his book so even here you can apply the you know uh, 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 spatial critical approaches or geo geopolitical approaches here so like that is one more book by beauty is a wound by eka kurniawan where uh, a mother or a uh, 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 a, a lady uh, a prostitute in fact uh, who, uh, who 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 names her uh, daughter as ugly All right. Uh, no, no. Sorry. Uh, uh, who know? Uh, who names her ugly daughter as beauty? So beauty. How uh, you know that uh, to define? He uh, he has uh, she has tried to de de define the brutality of uh, colonialism, the chaos produced by the post-war era, the 1965 massacre, and authoritarianism. Everything has uh, been uh, uh, discussed by. Uh, him in a, in this book so it uh, it also invites uh, uh, various geo geopolitical uh, approaches though the uh, and in fact the book was uh, uh, translated into around 34 languages and it has unforgettable characters and uh, those things that this can be a uh, new uh, can it, this it does invite a geopolitical perspective now japanese book like uh, uh, 
uh, a pale view of the hills or the housekeeper and the professor even these books are wonderfully crafted and has geo and has the uh, in, you know has a geo critical perspective if you read if we read it in that point of view, through that point of view it has assimilation of culture family transitions and uh, loss and discovery and all those things are, are discussed here in these books like for example like uh, the book by uh, haruki uh, haruki murakami the desire i am a cat where the cat observes uh, various people various spaces various places so these are wonderful books which can be uh, studied from the geographical perspective the geographical point of view then if you come to palestine of course you cannot leave arab countries here and palestine is a country which is very much uh, uh, you know in always in news as of course and uh, it also these books for example like my father was a freedom fighter by uh, by ramzi barud or i saw ramanalla by maurit bargoti they uh, they talks about the the impact of uh, the creation of uh, israel the war that took place then there after the, the gaza strip and the people living in those uh, villages how they are driven out of their uh, houses and the uh, Uh, when uh, the uh, like uh, uh, how they are pushed towards uh, uh, refugee camps when the uh, when Israelis came in and all those uh, you know uh, uh, s- uh, stories where uh, all those issues and concerns were discussed by these writers. So if you uh, want to understand, if you uh, if you really need to understand. the geopolitical impact or geopolitical impact on uh, the 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 palestinian public or palestinian people or the the people who are living in gaza strip you need to read their book they are extremely extremely influential as well for example the book by ghada uh, karmi in in search of fatima it talks about it's a very uh, wonderfully crafted book it's a uh, a book where uh, which talks about a, a palestinian family uh, who were uh, wealthy who was a palestinian wealthy family living in jerusalem but who were thrown out of their house by the jewish families because, uh, since they were uh, free to select and uh, and choose their home wherever they want to so uh, the the effect suddenly losing your place suddenly lo- uh, losing your property your house where you lived where you had a lot of your memories your personal and emotional memories so these all things uh, you know this very very uh, you know we can mincingly wrote by uh, chanda karmi so this also invites a geographical perspective in it like for example the other books by uh, the girl in the tank green scarf or the morning in jenin by susan uh, abdul hawa even they these books also talk, talks about uh, the, the impact of uh, the formation of israel the the impact of the formation on palestinian families and uh, the the syrian immigrant for example the, for the first book the girl in the tangled scarf uh, talks about the 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 impact of the uh, on the life of an uh, immigrant a young syrian immigrant khadra uh, shami when she uh, reaches indonesia indiana uh, in usa how and how she grew up as a muslim as a mixed culture for example the, the portrait so shows uh, she is wearing a scarf but she is in a jeans and top so how the culture is becoming mixed up how both cultures are like a, 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 a arabic culture and the american culture get mixed up and how this transformation or this uh, immigration and uh, migration results in the formation of various personal and uh, you know cultural spaces in their life you also to talks about here also the the books by the book by uh, susan habdul hawa mornings in jane also to- talks about uh, Uh, only farming the uh, you know uh, talks about a family who was uh, who was forcibly displaced from their only farming in the village uh, uh, from from a village newly uh, uh, formed israel's village in 1948 so all these things are all these ideas are so very uh, very much interesting and all they invite uh, definitely invite a geographical perspective so geographism cannot be limited to specific area or specific writing it has a mass appeal it has a great appeal it has a uh what do you say a wide range of appeal which can be studied from various 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 views so just to conclude 
just i would like to uh, focus on four points here just two minutes more every event ta uh, take place with uh, uh, with space alone and so also in the memory to remember a moment is to remember a place to have an idea is to have an idea of the place simple every moment as as we saw take this in in a place so when you if you remember a, a movement or a moment or a memory it must be connected to a place so it is connected everywhere you can say the impact of place and place even geography to occupy a space is one of the first act of human life right occupy you know building build you know you know building buildings and houses and all those uh, colonies also is the, the first uh, uh, you know action that we did moving communicating sensing and behaving all our special activities humans cannot escape escape uh, escape space life cannot be lived or imagined without space and hence space matters it does matter it does matter in any kind of approach in any kind of study so you cannot stay away you cannot do away you cannot uh, avoid the impact of geo uh, geography the space and other things thank you thank you very much uh, for to all of you for listening i think i took a lot of time sorry for that and uh, if you have any question i'm open to it thank you sir thank you professor dr deepak nair sir thank you for your elaborative presentation may i request the participants to type your questions in the comment box if there are any okay thank you thank you for the session once again professor dr deepak nair thank you very much now thank you sir thank you thanks thank a you, lot sir. uh now we will move to the next session this session is uh, the third one and the resource person for this session is dr mrudula sharma renowned literary and associate professor department of english meher chand mahajan dav college for women chandigarh and the topic for her presentation is the presentation of alterity in modern uh, or contemporary literature so without making any more delay may i request the ma'am to start her presentation dr mridula sharma ma'am thank you dr dr dn ganjebar uh, good afternoon everyone uh, it is my pleasure to be here to be part of this uh, national webinar and um, even though i'm in mean, uh, the time that was there at my disposal was uh, virtually two days but i um, uh, just grabbed at this opportunity because of the fact that there was an idea swirling around in my mind uh, just when the call for this conference came and uh, i accepted the invitation um, uh, uh, for uh, i mean basically that i would be able to air out my ideas uh so that is there so i congratulate the organizers for uh, having this uh, webinar and i was watching uh, the presentation uh that was being made by dr deepak nair it was such a vibrant presentation and i must apologize that i couldn't be part of this webinar before because of some uh, um uh, job that had to be carried out uh, at the level of my institution but now that i'm here i'm glad to be here and uh, my presentation is going to be an oral presentation only um for that i apologize because it is a trifle difficult for the participants to keep track of the uh, you know thought process of the presenter uh, when it is only an oral presentation but i begin without much uh, further ado and i am uh, very happy to say that uh, you know my um, uh, paper here which is representation of alterity in modern uh, and contemporary literature um uh, in this i'm going to make a special reference to mythological retellings and fantasy uh so um uh, it is a kind of a, uh, i mean we have uh, already heard about the various spaces that define identity and uh, it would be a kind of my paper would be a kind of a going ahead of uh, of identity so the representation of alterity can be recognized as one of the most oft repeated themes of contemporary literature the reason can perhaps be traced to the rapid and widespread changes in the entire world that began in the modernist era 
the uncertainties created by the two world wars the reinterpretation of religion necessitated by darwin's origin of species the fissures in the established social structures and thought patterns the rise of democratic and socialist ideals the political and emotional freedom of the previously colonized people and the availability of education for the masses it was as if a tectonic shift had occurred there were more stories that needed to be told propelling more people than ever into a flurry of creativity and self expression undoubtedly the advent of the modernist era brought in the other hitherto unheard voices such as the afro american the women writers to the forefront vying for their space at last under the literary sun continuing the trend the condition of post coloniality which characterizes the contemporary world and its narrative reproductions raises important questions about how to critically conceptualize the post colonial nation state in terms of the inclusion of ethno cultural variegation and alterity the post colonial theory cautions against normative and hegemonic representations a study of alterity therefore remains an interesting proposition especially in the light of recent discourses of both post ethnicity post raciality and also because cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism and multiculturalism at the same time have sparked forth many alterities in the contemporary world the idea of identity as a guaranteed continuity as stuart hall puts it was disrupted displaced and decentered forever by the turbulence of the world but first let us consider the meaning of alterity the concept of identity and its concomitant aspect of alterity has been probed theorized and problematized by various philosophers the plethora of work done on this socio political aspect has provided the scholars with an insight into this field of inquiry from many different angles the concept of alterity is lucidly explained by curtis w freeman in his work alterity and its cure alterity as etymologically derived from the latin word alter means one the state of being other or different two the character of that which is other in the other three the circumstance of others who are nominalized and distanced by hierarchical and stereotypical thinking four a technical term in post colonial studies denoting the condition of otherness resulting from the imposition of western culture five a category such that the markers of difference indicate the alterity of the other is irreducible and infinite alterity and i am quoting here cornelius castoriadis is seen as a radical otherness a non trivial novelty a non trivial novelty which emerges as a creative element of historical evolution of human kind according to cornelius castor uh, castoriadis who was a fr greek french philosopher social critic economist and psychoanalyst all put together social change involves radical discontinuities in other words a new and radical idea of the world marked by resurgence of the individual mm -hmm. jean botrelard sees alterity as a um, as a precious and transcendental element which is to quote uh, botrelard a masterpiece in peril an object lost or missing from our system but which is indispensable for enriching the world culture by cutting through the quote arrogant insular cultural narcissism gayatri chakravarti spivok used the term alterity in her text who claims alterity uh, that came out in 1989 as a means to subvert the male dominant historical and political structures by employing alterity with the tools that create alternative histories like gender class race and ethnicity 
uh, Spivok forwarded an alternate point of view to remove the blind and bind of constructed histories. A variety of others can be included in the concept of alterity, depending upon the perspective. These can be the savage, uncivilized, and uncouth people of the Orient, or the supposed primates of the dark continent, as mentioned in the imperial discourse. These can be the migrants, voluntary or involuntary, or minority ethnicities, certain religious communities, or economically backward classes, to name a few. Alterity, therefore, encompasses all those elements in a society, locally, across the nation, or globally, which are in difference to the self. The self as established by the dominant discourse in literature. This difference between the self and the other gives a twofold purpose to alterity. Firstly, it provides a scaffold to the dominant voice for constructing a subject. And secondly, it provides a mouthpiece for expression and enunciation to the hitherto subdued voices. In its former, former stance, the tool of alterity is employed by the dominant structures to create a discourse that regulates an identity formation in its favor. While the latter stance of alterity is an antithesis of the nominalized viewpoint as established by the dominant discourse. Therefore, in its latter sense, alterity gives a chance to bring the other or others to the forefront and provides them with a platform, a reason for assert assertion. It is in its later second sense that I would be talking of alterity. The work of Emmanuel Levinas, Alterity and Transcendence, is helpful in further understanding the other. Positing the other as a separate entity than the self, Levinas demands a reverential attitude towards alterity. This is an important point of departure from the parochial view of the other as established by the imperial and the later new colonial discourse. Hence, in a way, Levinas gives us an ethical and I would say egalitarian view of otherness. According to him, an encounter with the other provides an opportunity to understand them as they are. This excludes the possibility of any bias or assumption of the other, as proposed and adopted by the imperial discourse. So, in a way, the colonial discourse had led to the ideological exile of the other from its authentic self. As the Occident built the image of the Orient according to its interests, and for upholding its own claim of superiority. Of course, we have Edward Said and his Orientalism to concretize this claim. Post-colonial literature attempted to counter these colonial projections by subverting them completely. The re-examination of the imperial narratives through the colonized uh, perspective promised the representation of a more authentic alterity as depicted in the wor works of V.S. Naipaul and Salman Rushdie and Chinu Achebe, Gugi Thiongo uh, of another continent, to name a few. However, in the post-national cosmopolitan world, alterity is rather multidimensional. It exists as and in immigrant experiences, interracial confrontations, class divides, economic disparities, social inequities, etc., and the exploration of all of which is vital. According to Stuart Hall, in his work, Cultural Identity and Diaspora, cultural identity in virtually all its aspects is both a point of similarity owing to a shared history, as well as a significant difference which constitutes what we really are or rather what we have become. I think uh, Dr. Deepak Nair talked about uh, this particular thing when he was talking about representations from Sri Lanka. So in the context of diasporic identity specifically, Hall defines it as that which lives with and through, not despite difference by hybrid, hybridity. 
this convergence of differences along with similarities in any identity leads with uniqueness albeit a troubled uniqueness sometimes an example in this regard is zo by combs you can't get lost in cape town which deals with the issue of feeling exiled within the homeland owing to the colored descent based in south africa's apartheid era the story explores the experience of colored citizens in the racial crucible of their country the protagonist frida shenton born in south africa rural south africa goes through the vicissitudes of being forced to emulate the whites and then eventually realizing the potential exile that marginali marginalization has conferred upon her the works of gugi wothiongo are laden with issues related to native identity alterity and hybridity in an interesting way in one of his novels petals of blood for example gugi wothiongo deals with the condition of kenya and its subjects in the aftermath of independence from the empire through the story of four characters munira abdullah wanja and kariga gugi questions the stance of people in newly liberated kenya and what identity they are supposed to embrace the native self the emulation of the west or a fusion of both along with the question of identity the novel also probes into the challenges of capitalism and its politico economic effects on the native population alterity can be seen in gugi's work as the fusion of the <clears throat> native self and the western other and hybridity as the disruption of native identity and simultaneous fusion with its westernized counterpart making both different and the same moving on to the second part of my uh, presentation as race is the point of refraction in a major part of the world in india religion frequently becomes the tool with which alterities are shaped and created for instance said naqvi's being the other the muslim in india gives an account of how the muslims were othered within their homeland the book chalks out various historical events that expose the similarities and differences between the hindus and muslims and then establishes the political interventions that have led to equating the muslim with the other rakshanda jalil's recent book but you don't look, look look like a muslim but you don't look like a muslim also gives an account of various occasions when the image of muslim is appropriated and branded as the other she urges through her work to undo the bracketing of muslims as the other and to look at them through a neutral uh, lens tabish khair's fictional and non fictional world has many figures struggling with their alterity in terms of their religion race and nationality Brinda Chari's Naked in the Wind gives an account of how the current generation of Roman Catholic Anglo-Indians deal with their alterity. Some have unconsciously internalized even a few Hindu practices of worship, while some of them make a conscious effort in terms of dressing up in a manner that they merge rather than stand out in a town with Hindu majority. In this thought-provoking work of fiction, Brinda Chari follows the technique of giving chapter wise separate spaces for narratives of the main characters from different religions till the time the stories merge in a fiery crescendo the book shows us new ways of understanding a country in transition where religious and communal identities have begun to define the very nature of existence K Ilaiya in his book post hindu india a discourse on dalit bahujan socio spiritual and scientific revolution gives a detailed analysis of the religious and social factors that have kept india backward a backward nation in terms of philosophical and scientific advancement it was the oppressed productive castes who were largely responsible for the scientific and mathematical discoveries attributed to india in the ancient period he writes 
but the caste system and the upper caste lack of interest and support in improving and working techniques did not uh, improving the working techniques did not allow these nascent ideas to bloom he finds fault with the hindu spiritual world uh, and its religious uh, books from the rigved to the ramayan to the bhagavad gita as these leave hardly any scope for creative interpretation to undo caste and superstition he calls the priestly class the authors of spiritual fascism who constructed the others as low inferior and ignorant their brand of spiritual fascism was institutionalized through their books he rules the fact that these books were written in an exclusivist language sanskrit and do not talk about human equality in the spiritual realm or human relations in their normal form elaya says and i quote these books do not talk about child care they do not frame the rules for nursing the old and the sick they do not contain stories and parables about human achievements and failures neither the hindu gods nor the brahmins fail in their day to day life the failure is attributed to the shudras chandals and the adivasis as an illustration ilaya quotes the ramayan wherein uh, ram sends sita to the forest acting on the accusatory utterance of a chakali man charging sita with sexual immorality notably this caste has been said to occupy the lowest position in the hindu social order since the earlier uh, times in contemporary india chakali or washerman community is still an underprivileged community trapped in poverty illiteracy and social discrimination and yet just due to his bitter tirade in the ramayana the chakali man is projected as the source of suffering of sita whereas as per ilaya's findings chakali men are the least male chauvinist uh, i quote because their mind and body has been degendered unquote as a result of this representation both the chakali man and the kshatriya woman sita are the agents of historical suffering as their beings are caught up in the cobweb of spiritual fascism not only this elaya feels that the conflicts in these books are resolved only by war and the idolatry figures are all constructed as idolatry uh, sorry as uh, warrior gods the social practice of discourse and debate prevalent among uh, the adivasis or the chandals finds no place here the ethics morality and social conduct to be followed or at least looked up two by the masses are all put down in the written word by the dominant voices and subsequently established as cardinal principles through relentless repetition there is simply no room for counter opinion to make matters worse exemplifies elaya in a spill over effect the morality that emerged out of the ramayan is made concrete in a sentence that became a part of modern grammar books in order to show the relationship between subject object and predicate which is ram killed ravan the new narratives that have emerged in the last two decades or so in the field of uh, retellings of the epics seem to challenge the established written word and voice the less represented if not the totally defamed or the totally ignored alterities anand nilkantan's books such as asura tale of the vanquished was the suppressed or the defeated party and in this particular case the very antagonist in the original epic ravan in this book by neil kantan is shown as the champion of the cause of the marginalized not only this anand neil kantan also presents the versions of some irrelevant and minor characters of the ramayan such as bhadra a common asur who has a remarkable story to tell different from his king ravan neel kantan therefore calls it asurayan in which ravan sees himself as an epitome of a complete human being with his 10 heads as 10 facets without any pretense to holiness or restricted by social and religious norms 
the brahminical order is critiqued and one hears the echoes of ilaya when neil ganton writes quote they that is the brahmins knew how to project even the mundane tasks of burning twigs as earth shaking scientific discoveries and claim to tame the forces that control the world and it was funny that the majority of people like the carpenters masons and farmers who were doing something meaningful had become supplicant to these jokers unquote such writings are frequently debunked as presenting a new alternative world of religious extrapolations where sense is subdued with personal whims it may be so or it may not be but in terms of voicing the other side such books may very well have ushered in the age age of alterities while we are discussing the centering of the antagonist other against a mythological background there is another emerging literary practice which cannot be ignored and mention must be therefore made of various books that uh, bring about the narrative from the point of view of the female characters Chitra Banerjee Devakarani's The Palace of Illusions uh, narrates the story of Draupadi by Draupadi. I'm borrowing the lines used by Booklist, a publication of American Library Association that provides critical reviews of books uh, to summarize the plot. Quote, smart, resilient and courageous. And I would add intelligent and scholarly. Panchali, born of fire. marries all five of the famously heroic pandava brothers harbors a secret love for karna endures a long exile in the wilderness slowly learns the truth about krishna her mysterious friend unquote what she doesn't do however is take the responsibility of the catastrophic war which usually she is charged with and instead analyzes the egos and power hunger of both the sides that propelled thousands to their death the questioning of the patriarchal order the inadequacy at not having an independent identity other than drupad's daughter the awareness of being unwanted in the family in the first place the condescending acceptance just because she is beautiful though dusky the pain of arjun losing interest in her and moving to multiple affairs and then during the war the killing of the younger scions of the pandava family the vast graveyard that the battleground becomes and the ultimate aloneness that she feels during the famous heavenly ascent all are sensitively rendered through the sieve of feminine sensibilities these are the reimaginings of something not described before and as readers one does realize that the hitherto unsaid also had great weight and value and that the vast storehouse of dropadi's feelings reactions trials struggles conflicts and suffering had remained unexplored and wrongly so the strengthening of the female voice in contemporary literature has opened new vistas of stories in retrospect where the erstwhile muted have emerged as living thinking individuals with their own viewpoint and imprint it may be also interesting to note that the rendition of this side of the story is in the epic tradition with all the grace grandeur and sublimity attributed to the original creation by ved vyas which is an alterity within itself taking a little detour I want to mention something I read in Shashi Deshpande's novel The Binding Vine which was the discovery of the protagonist that women in the ancient times were not allowed to use Sanskrit and were allotted the qualitatively inferior prakrit for usage I have not been really able to confirm this claim and would welcome if someone could shed some light on this but the point I want to make is that if this was true then the retelling has even more connotations kavita kane's book lanka's princess and karna's wife the outcast queen belong to the same order of writing karna's wife is from the point of view of uruvi a kshatriya uh, princess who marries karna the adopted son of a low caste charioteer and is a fictional character and lanka's princess is of course shurnaka 
the woman held responsible for putting Ravan on the path of self-destruction. Similarly, the book Sita, Warrior of Mithila by Amish indicates the presence of alterity in its very title as it begins to construct an image almost inversely different from the Sita as we have known her. Rightly so, as we traverse the novel, we come across a woman who is strong, trained in warfare, an expert strategist, a visionary, patriot and more, rather than just a silent, obedient wife. Clearly, the 21st century ideal Indian woman is a feminist icon, a combination of physical strength and mental agility. In an interview to the Hindustan Times, Amish opines, quote, the basic idea is that multiple truths can exist. All of us are in the same room, but one month later, each one of us will have a slightly different recollection of this day. I thought it would be interesting to have the backstories of the main characters, which converges into a common narrative. When asked whether the depictions of characters or the plot were true, Amish replies, Indian civilization believes in multiple truths. And that is the strength of the Indian way of life. He also suggests that it is no use worrying about a singular truth, a reflection of what Spivok calls creating alternative histories. Moving on to the third uh, part of my presentation. Just like the mythological element, fantasy too has, too has been perennial and ubiquitous in literature. However, the alterity of the world of fantasy acquires more newer meanings in the contemporary context because of the unheard challenges, including apocalyptic forecasts being faced by the inhabitants of this earth in the recent past. Essentially, fictional world is always an imaginary world, despite the fact that the characters and situations are from the world as we know it, and the reference points are therefore familiar. But fantasy is a realm of literature where the usual reference points are either missing or used in a way so as to comprehend and connect to the earthly connotations through some delving into the memory of the primordial or the symbolic. Of course, there is the limitation of language and the challenge emerging thereof where the unknown and unremembered is to be understood through the established and memorized codes of communication. This limitation can, however, be turned into an asset by using the known language for creating portrayals that are so challenging to the accepted truths of existence, of being, that the alterity of the portrayal is immediately established. These imaginary worlds are so created can have a strong, uh, has, that they can have a strong cultural influence on their audience, providing them the impetus to affect real lives. For example, the issue of global warming goes beyond the national boundaries. The onus lies on the inhabitants of the world. How does a writer address humankind as a whole, an interconnected whole, while avoiding the politics that divides? Probably by creating another world with a different philosophy of life <clears throat> that puts our earthly way of thinking in sharp perspective. In a way, it is the presentation of a complete alterity. Usually, this alterity is termed as aliens. In his work, Alien Sheik, Neil Badminton, explains how humans use the concept of the alien to posit their humanness as something to be elevated above and cherished over the alienness of the other. However, there are works of fiction wherein imaginary worlds have dealt with the issue of understanding differences for the betterment of all life, aliens and humans included. In this category falls Ursula Gwynne. Gwynne was known for her works of speculative fiction and the Taoist ideas about balance, and equilibrium and leaving things alone have been identified in several of her writings. She moved away from the usual fantasy trope of white man conquers the universe. That is by her protagonists, several of whom are anthropologists or ethnologists, 
try not to meddle with the alien cultures they encounter. She also shows a reconciliation of opposites, such as light and dark, or good and evil, which, in my opinion, is a clear-cut example of showing reverence to alterity. In her own words, variables are the spice of life. You can read science fiction as a thought experiment. She wonders at the possibility of Mary Shelley making the young doctor create a human being rather than a monster. Gwyn's writings often examine alien cultures, um, and particularly the human cultures from planets other than Earth. In discovering these alien worlds, Gwyn's uh, protagonists, and by extension the readers, also journey into themselves and challenge the nature of what they consider alien and what they consider native. Many of our protagonists are dark-skinned individuals in comparison to the white-skinned heroes more traditionally used, a kind of switching of race roles. She explained this choice saying, most people in the world aren't white. Why in the future would we assume they are? The story of one of her books, The Left Hand of Darkness, is set in a fictional planet where the inhabitants are androgynous. And the best result of this is that the planet is a society without war. Another of Nguyen's book published in 1970, right in the wake of the Vietnam uh, War, the word for world is forest. It portrays the familiar plight of a fictional planet whose resources are being ruthlessly exploited by the humans. Its inhabitants are forced into slavery under extremely cruel conditions. The humans justify this behavior by telling themselves that the wilderness needs to be tamed, the businesses need to make profit, and the native inhabitants called Etchians are just primitive creatures who don't feel pain and need to learn what is real work. The fact that the Etchians have been analyzed to be non-aggressive only provides the colonizers further impetus to exploit them. The Etchians rescue themselves and their planet by integrating the violence found in human culture into their own culture. The text also shows how the perceived linearity of things by some narrow-minded humans as opposed to interconnectivity is one reason why the world is seen as fit to exploit. It is therefore quite an apt study on how humans base their identity on not only the othering of species, which are different, but also on the othering of other humans. The echo of the colonial agenda is unmistakable and perhaps a warning that the expansionist ambitions of the powerful may yet be far from over. But more than that is the looming threat that if weakness of a particular people decides their alterity, their embracing of violence as a defense tactic may erase that difference. In the absence of this balancing difference, the precariousness of our existence is foregrounded even more. Another book which I want to bring into my discussion is A Door into Ocean by Joan Slonsweski which was published in 1986. This book details the struggles of an all-female alien species called sharers to save themselves and their planet from being exploited by the humans. The sharers adopt a non-aggressive, non-violent policy <clears throat> to deal with the humans and do not react even under extreme militaristic uh, uh, pressure. This causes their species to be almost annihilated. However, at the, at the last moment, they are saved as their philosophy and tactics finally create an impact on the mind of the general who is leading the military campaign against them. A major part of the text emphasizes interconnectivity by positing that every single thing which is a part of life influences other things. This seems to be a literary engagement with Bruno Latour's actor network theory, in which Latour posits that each single entity in the world, whether it be human, plant, animal, or thing, is a part of a network in which it engages and acts, 
influencing the actions of other actors. In the language of the sharers, all verbs are expressed in the form of sharing, of acting and being acted upon at the same time. Everything can be shared except death. The last text to be analyzed in this study, Villa of the Wood by Robert Bietti, was recently published in 2018. It is a historical fantasy about Willa, a young Faerun girl, fairy-like being, who is encouraged to fear and hate the humans who have invaded the forest in which her clan lives. And I'm again reminded of uh, the two responses to the Oriental as mentioned by Edward Said, fear and hate. The humans have killed the trees, the animals, and apparently almost all of her family. The leader of Villa's clan, the Pandaran, uh, the Pandaran, sorry, believes that the only way the Faerun can survive is by adapting to the ways of the humans and begin killing the animals themselves. But fear and hate have always disagreed with Villa's empathic nature. Unlike the Pandaran, she has never had trouble contending with differences. And her heart can never agree to harm the animals who have always been her friends. As her differing actions force her out into the world, she discovers that the truth about humans um, is not as simple as it seems. And the actual destroyer of a people is the pattern himself. In other words, the detachment and violence he has brought into the clan are slowly poisoning the Faerun and killing them. Willa begins to more strongly realize that there are countless ways of living one's life and all humans do not follow the same ways. The perspective used in the text adheres to an animist cosmology, bringing aspects of panpsychism into forefront, especially the idea that the mind is a fundamental feature of the world which exists throughout the universe. The differences or the alterity may sometimes be just at the level of the physical and the geographical. Quite noticeably, all imaginary worlds in the text mentioned view the world as an interconnected whole, but the differences in this interconnectivity are dealt with in differing ways in each world. The Etchians strongly realize the interconnectivity of the world and know that affecting one part of it will affect other parts as well. As the title, the word for world is forest suggests, in their language, world and forest are the same world. For the sharers, interconnectivity is vital to survival, which is why they don't kill the huge sea-swallowing bees that have destroyed their homes and lives. The challenge for them is figuring out how humans belong to this web, or if they do at all. Willa recognizes that everything natural is alive, and everything has its own agency, even the rocks and rivers. She knows instinctively that the survival of all living beings in the forest depends on all other natural things. These are then my observations about some of the representations of alterity, the world, its environment, its social, economic and political atmosphere. The seeds of alterity are there in every fold, making narratives multi-layered, triggering off a polyphony which can enrich the reading experiences with all its nuances. The creation is all out there for us, the readers, to see. Undoubtedly, it will cultivate a certain sensitivity and an appreciation, a patience to take into consideration the counterpoint, to not believe that it is only power that should have a voice. Writing is an empowering tool, as we all know, but now reading and listening are empowering too. Can we then not hope that the world will be a better place than the one we know now? Thank you. Thank you for your enlightening speech. Uh, are there any questions on the part of the participants? Okay, ma'am. Thank you. There are no questions at all. Thank, Thank you. you for your uh, nice presentation, ma'am. Thank you very much.
So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we are moving to the last uh, but requisite session of this webinar. So, may I now introduce to the delegates to our resource person, Professor Dr. Rohidas Nitonde sir. Professor Dr. Rohidas Nitonde sir is a renowned critic and an associate professor and IQSC coordinator. He belongs to the Department of English, Sri Sivaji College, Parvin. Sir has more than 15 years experience to his credit and many books, reference books, and he has contributed a lot to the national and international conferences as a resource person. His topic of presentation for today's webinar is Nigerian Literature in English. May I request you, sir, Dr. Rohidas Ritonde, sir, to have your elegant speech in front of the participants. Dr. Rohidas Ritonde, sir. Hello, am I audible, sir? Hello. Yes, sir, please continue. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. The uh, organizer of uh, this uh, one day national webinar, uh, uh, Professor Dr. D.N. Ganjewar, sir, the uh, principal of the host college, Dr. Sirsat, sir, the resource persons for uh, this. Uh, webinar uh, and all the delegate part, uh, participants. Uh, at the outset, I express my uh, gratitude towards the host uh, institution for extending their invitation to me uh, for such a wonderful program. Uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, as uh, the webinar is to cater uh, the uh, modern and contemporary literatures in English, particularly the new literatures. Today, I am going to explore the uh, Nigerian literature in English uh, during my uh, talk. As friends, we know that uh, these days uh, we have not only English literature, but also we have literatures in English. And these literatures are from different nations and cultures. As we know that English is the language of the colonizers and of the colonized as well. My presentation today or the talk that I am going to deliver is basically uh, addressing how this new literature from the uh, non-native English uh, communities is taking its place and how it is being uh, developed and uh, for that, uh, I am using Nigerian English literature as a case study. So, uh, the whole of my argument is that uh, how those people who don't have English as their mother tongue or who are not the English nations and they have started writing in English and their literature in English is uh, now competing uh, with the established literature or what, uh, what we call the canon of English literature, because these writers from these countries uh, are also popular all over the world, as well as they are the bestsellers and they are having the literary value that oh, is there in uh, many of the almost uh, classical uh, writings. In that case, let us uh, go back how these new literatures are uh, different from the uh, so-called classical literatures. See, uh, as we know that uh, the classical literature is even, uh, literal classical is there in English, uh, but the English literature is considered as the one which has lead. And whenever you are talking about English literature, mainly we talk about uh, British literature. But what about the other uh, literatures that are there in English? And that's why I am talking about today uh, the Nigerian literature in English. Uh, as we know that Nigeria is a part of 
Africa and African continent. So Nigerian literature is uh, obviously representing some African features or the African writings. Let us understand. Try to understand. Uh, African literature is that way. Uh, Africa has a great tradition of oral literature, and African literature existed even before the colonial period. The only thing is that when we talk about the African literature in English, the uh, we refer to the writings that are there in English. Uh, otherwise, Africa has a great tradition uh, of its own oral uh, folk literature. and the diversity that we can see in the african literature is at par with the any other old literatures so the thing that i am saying is that um, african literature is having a long tradition it is oral tradition but after uh, as we all know that after chinua achebe's things fall apart and the uh, colonial uh, a colonialization has uh, uh, brought english to the african subcontinent and we come to know about the congo and many other things so uh, let us see that the heart of darkness is revealed when we came to know about africa from the africans themselves because african literature or let us say the nigerian literature or the third world literature uh in the early phase what we come you know, what we knew about uh, the africa was the white man's impression of africa and so the uh, white man's perspective towards africa was uh, different than the africans they themselves saw their own country nation culture and they depicted it through their writings uh, in uh, Uh, their literature so we have uh, earlier writers those who wrote about africa but they were the white men and they uh, ex exploited african theme and the uh, exotic things that were there in africa but when uh, the english education entered the continent and the uh, native african writers started write, began writing in english we could see a major change that has uh, taken place and that change was africa's uh, own voices and so what are the genuine african uh, uh, values that are reflected in the african literature so uh, when african started expressing in english when they started writing in english so they used english language for their expression so then only then and then we can say that the true african literature was being shaped and for that matter we have the great writers like chinua achiba achibi uh, also inka though we know that uh, though it is said that the uh, uh, so inka own nobel uh, prize for literature and uh, he uh, uh received uh attention of the audience from all over the world one thing is very important though chinua achebe could not be a nobel laureate but his contribution is that he broke the ground and his ground breaking work could pave the way to the many more uh, africans to uh represent their own identity and that is why as the theme of one of the you know key uh, points in uh, today's uh, webinar is from heritage to identity so as you say that africa had a heritage okay and african heritage uh, was explored by the uh, non african or let's say the english writers writing about africa but with the uh, beginning of new train that is uh, english writing by the africans what we could see that 
instead of talking about those heritage they started to talk about their identity and so the african literature was talking about the african identity uh, the description of africa as a continent uh, and uh, the nations that are there uh, as we know that basically african literature is uh, uh, literature uh, uh, in english particularly africa has uh, so many languages there are several countries but mainly the uh, english literature that is there in africa uh, is uh, divided into south african literature nigerian literature and the literature from the other nations of african subcontinent uh, and that is how the nigerian literature is the important body of the african um, studies or african literature as you know that uh, africa is the birthplace of human species it is a vast continent uh, diverse in nature and there are lot of tribes uh, oral stories then we have oral literature and there are so many religions as well it is rich in music and literature also and after colonization when the english literature uh, education came there the uh, native africans began writing in english uh, we have there uh, so many uh, people uh, who are arabs europeans and south asians that are there also living in africa african literature is written in both afro asiatic languages and african languages uh, as well uh, even it is in uh, arabic uh, and uh, the talk that i am talking about is uh, the uh, african literature uh, english uh, africa has some nobel laureates to its credit but uh, what about the modern african literature if you say that uh, there are certain writers to whom about whom uh, will be uh, 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 exploring in detail uh, if somebody asks uh, what is there in nigeria i mean uh, jino achebe was there in nigeria and he has worked a lot it is not that he has written literature and through his uh, masterpieces that uh, uh, he has served the nation but the other uh, task he has done is that he has shaped a generation of writers that are uh, exploring nigerian identity in uh, literature so let us uh, uh, have a look at uh, these major nigerian writers uh, even what is there in nigeria as i said that nigeria is an african country and so whatever i talked about uh, almost that uh, uh, about african literature and african subcontinent uh, that that is typical representative of uh, nigeria also Nigeria is a nation which has fought a lot for even uh, initially for its own freedom from the uh, imperialism and later on there was a civil war in Nigeria which is called also Biafran war uh, uh, in the Biafra uh, the civil war uh, took place and there was for little span uh, the Biafran uh, yes, independent nation and so uh, the country is going through the political uh, uh, upheaval as well uh, whatever we see is that uh, nigeria is a country wherein there is lot of population there is scarcity of there so many things there are many social problems health issues and uh, political um, uh, problems are there but it is not that there are only problems many times we come to know about the uh, problems and oddities but what about the rich heritage it has got what about the people and what about their identity and mindset whether they are changing or not and now the nigerians are moving to the us and uk so nigeria is having its diaspora in the other countries as well so the journey of nigerian literature that began uh, with uh, chinua achebe's things fall apart has 
contrast to the current day writers and we see that uh, the current day writers are also uh, representing the nation uh, at a global level what are the trends there uh, all over the world uh, they are being found in the nigerian literature as well if you ask me what are the three important uh, or a couple of important books uh, nigerian books that uh, one should see and among uh, such books we can see that uh, as er everyone knows uh, things fall apart that is the first generation writing of the nigerian writers in english we have uh, all soinka's uh, salutations to the god and the third generation contemporary nigerian writer chimamanda naguji adichi's americana americana is the third important book uh, that is representing typically the literature of nigeria <clears throat> so we have uh, the writers of the first generation the second generation and the third generation there is again <coughs> global trend of uh, feminist writing Uh, african literature uh, sorry nigerian literature is typically representing that uh, trend also so nigeria uh, even in the first uh, decade of the 21st century uh, we saw that <coughs> there was a trend about uh, you see uh, immigration and diaspora so nigerian literature is today having diasporic writers as well it deals with the theme of diaspora then uh, we are having racism is a crucial issue these days nigerian writers are addressing that too again uh, the uh, one more thing is uh, we have seen uh, diaspora is there uh, and even whatever the smaller or bigger things that are happening in uh, the current age the contemporary period nigerians are reflecting to that uh, as we know that <coughs> pandemic has also uh, entered into the literature as this is uh, the uh, second biggest thing in the uh, world in this century the first one the 911 event and so the uh, terrorism is also one important issue that is being addressed by all the important Uh, writers and uh, literatures uh, across the globe so nigerian writers are successfully dealing with these representative themes that are there in any english literature i mean when i am saying that any english literature my intention is to compare nigerian english literature in english with the established canons of english literature for example we are having british literature as well as the uh, canadian literature and american literature also so uh, these writers they are talking about their cultures as uh, we know that uh, uh, nigeria is having mainly many cultures but mainly identical uh, uh, three important cultures are uh, the uh, igbo eruba and hausa as uh, we know that uh, igbo is achebe's culture eruba is soinka's and hausa is the uh, uh, islamic culture there in uh, nigeria so the uh, nigerian literature is not the literature typically having representation of only one culture if you see nigerian writers in english you will find that these writers they represent all these three major cultures so we are having writers that describe uh, igbo then uh, eruba as well as the hausa culture and even the speciality of the contemporary nigerian writers is that the one very single writer is also representing all the three varieties it is not that that uh, the compartmentalization that only one author is talking about uh, one culture and he is completely ignoring the other cultures because 
दीज कल्चर को एग्जिस्ट देयर को एग्जिस्टेंस विल टेक द कंट्री टू पीस एंड प्रॉस्पेरिटी दिस इज द बिलीफ अमंग the new nigerian writers of the third generation so there are many other things uh, but the identity that uh, nigerian literature has gained uh, is typically of uh, comprises of its literary canon and uh, i would like to uh, name a few writers uh, uh, that are there uh, basically representing the nigerian um, trends uh, in literature sorry as we uh, have already discussed that uh, chinua achibi uh, need not we talk about chinua achibi and his contribution to the nigerian literature uh, because uh, it it is just what the african native traditions are there and igbo people and igbo land uh, the first authentic introduction to the igbo land is by uh, achibi uh, only and then uh, see from there onwards to the nigerian uh, republic okay we could see that uh, the things that uh, have been there in literature particularly uh, the uh, human values the societal values as well as individuals struggle to find a place in the environment wherein he is all these issues are there in uh, his writings then we have also inka who is a playwright poet and uh, the nobel laureate for the year 1986 uh, his writings explore uh, again as i said that yoruba culture and then Uh, Phebe Oso Fisan is another important writer uh, who talks about the uh, feminine issues and sensibility in the Nigerian context. The uh, Trojan Woman uh, is also his Women of Aou is the reworking of the Trojan Women, uh, and then uh, we are having Ben Okri. Ben Okri is also a significant writer. uh his famous works are uh, um, pamish road uh, the uh, forming part of a trilogy and uh, he has written some other works also and the most important thing is as uh, this uh, webinar is about post modernity in the new literatures so ben okri represents the post modern condition in the nigerian nation so uh, his uh, writings they address the uh, post modernity that is being experienced by the uh, writers uh, i would like to quote one uh, uh, statement from ben okri uh, he says that our future is greater than our past instead of saying that our past is not good but he says that we are having a great past but our future is greater this is a optimistic view to look at uh, the nation and its people Buchi Ibijeta is also uh, the Nigerian writer. As I said, that Nigeria is having set of writers uh, or representative writers that are representing diverse backgrounds. The writers like Chinua Achebe, also Inka, they were there in uh, Nigeria and then they wrote about Nigeria. Later on, uh, at the latter phase of their uh, career, they moved to the other countries. Uh, like that Bu buchi emicheta is one who uh, went to uh, england uh, london and she got settled there and then um, and after that uh, she could see that uh, she has written so many things like the joys of motherhood uh, most acclaimed work that she has written and there we see that that is the beginning of the feminist writing Uh, uh, let us say uh, women's writing in nigerian literature in english uh, her uh, work the joys of motherhood talks about uh, see, motherhood is a thing that one needs to celebrate how it is celebrated so uh, and uh, this uh, women's writing uh, continued there uh, after even that 
we have again there uh, Sefi Ata, uh, whose uh, everything good will come. Uh, say uh, the, even uh, the positive things that are there. So Africa or Nigerians have uh, not lost hope, though their present situation, uh, socio, economic, and political, is not that much uh, uh, favorable. Uh, or uh, that much optimistic if compared with the other nations or the first world nations, but their mindset is that much toughened that they have so many hopes from the time that will come. So we have Sefi Ata uh, there. Then uh, he, uh, Helen Habila uh, is another important writer. Uh, and Harel Habila's uh, uh, typical uh, uh, achievement is that he has gained access to his sophisticated and poetic literary voice. So, uh, uh, and uh, the dictatorship uh, rule in Nigeria is also uh, being explored by Helen Habila. We have Teju Kole, and then uh, there is. Uh, Ada Obi, Tracy, Nawaboni. Uh, interesting thing. I do not come to you by chance. It's a wonderful uh, uh, book that uh, she has written. Uh, Ada Obi, Tracy, Nawaboni. Uh, and uh, is told in a witty and irrelevant tone that believes the fundamental issues it addresses. So, um, I do not come to you by chance. That is what the firmness, identity, and uh, the confrontation that is there with the new writers of the uh, Nigerian origin and uh, born there uh, and brought up in the culture. Just a moment. So uh, uh, this is what the new voices are there. Uh, the book that I am talking about is just 2010 release. Uh, I don't, uh, I do not come to you uh, by chance. And then there is one representative voice of Nigeria that is um, uh, very contemporary and uh, representing uh, the, let us say, clan of Shinoa Achibi is Chimabanda Nagoji Adichi. A young lady who is quite popular there in England, America, uh, Nigeria, South Africa, and almost all over the world. Her books are translated in more than 100 languages, and uh, she has received numerous awards, literary awards, for her work. So uh, she is representing uh, the typical Nigerian mindset that is there. If you want to see uh, up to which uh, height the Nigerian literature in English has reached, just you read any one of uh, Chimamanda Naguji Adichie's work. Uh, and if you want to suggest me one title, then it is Americana. You ask any Nigerian study scholar uh, to suggest few books, and he will suggest Americana in if not out of two but if you ask him three titles and it will be one because americana which was published in 2013 is the most representative contemporary nigerian uh, writing and uh, there uh, she is talking about uh, so many issues there is culture there is racism there is diasporic experiences, then there is identity crisis, and there are so many other issues that are uh, in Americana by Adichie. And uh, even the other books that she has written, uh, Purple Hibiscus, uh, Half of a Yellow Sun, and uh, uh, we have The Thing Around Your Neck, a short story collection. Uh, friends, <coughs> Uh, it is uh, the uh, speciality that she writes about uh, the history of the nation also. So, uh, 
historical representation of uh, continent uh, country is also one of the uh, important tasks that the uh, writers they perform adichi's uh, writing is uh, creating history it is a recreation of the history and even it is not that she is only involved in the uh, literature and literary movements uh, it is uh, her intention to uh, give uh, the nigeria its own <coughs> identity and nigerians the respect that they uh, deserve particularly when she is writing about the nigerian women so she says that even in niger uh, even these days in nigeria when a man and women they are <coughs> together uh, in a hotel the waiter will greet the man though he is paid by a woman this is what the biased attitude uh, Uh, in uh, the society about the women uh, then uh, the next thing uh, is that uh, uh, women are not i mean uh, allowed to move uh, freely as compared to men uh, for example if a single woman enters in a hotel uh, there is a great chance that that she may be questioned uh, uh, why she is there obviously the questioning is derogatory and uh, adichi has uh, written a lot and given so many interviews about this uh, in a nutshell what i would like to say is that the nigerian literature is though in english particularly though it is young it has a short history but its history is uh, and the present and future are bright it is representing the trends that are there in all over the world in global literature the potential of the contemporary writers is very much uh, uh, influential and they have reader wider readership wider uh, global readership and <clears throat> they are being read and translated into uh, many countries uh, then the award winning uh, the awards are also going to those writers but what is important is that these writers are committed to their own people their identity and so they are advocating the way nigeria is two other uh, books that she has written is are uh, the one is a uh, feminist manifesto in 14 points and uh, the other we should all be feminists when a writer is writing a book like we should all be feminist she is advocating feminism and that is what i am saying that uh, <clears throat> the original uh, african culture was the culture wherein there was not uh, patriarchy hmm. so it was a woman centric culture it was the man who used to go to the woman's house after marriage but with the global trends with the colonization even if the people uh, okay the uh, bourgeois uh, is thinking in one way but th- we have the young third generation of nigerian writers that are urging for the change that is required there and so uh, uh, <coughs> she has come with an ars that we all should be feminists uh in this way we can see that there is a comparatively younger literature called nigerian literature in english but it has potential uh, earlier english people wrote about uh, nigeria and other countries in africa and so we began uh, we have a beginning of african studies with the writings of the english or white people writing about africa later on the african natives who learned english as a colonial rule was there in nigeria and africa so africans uh, wrote in english and they wrote about their continent and it was exploration of the continent then uh, there was the second generation who paved the identity for uh, the nigerian uh, nationals in the literature 
and now the third generation or let us say contemporary nigerian writers in english are uh, there to write about the nigerian sensitivity the socio economic cultural political problems that are there there is uh, i mean they are writing about so many issues they are writing about boko haram they are writing about kidnapping they are writing about the attacks uh, uh, that take place in the academia the university professors they are writing about how the uh, next generation children are not properly being brought up they are writing about the financial problems they are writing about the uh, corruption that is there in the uh, medical uh, profession and uh, so many other issues as well as they are writing about their own history their um, civil we have a new chapter there in nigerian literature about the biafran war and uh, how the writers the various writers the english writers they look at uh, the uh, civil war that took place in nigeria so uh, today uh, we are at a junction where uh, we can see that nigerian literature is coming with a lot of potential and uh, there are so many things that will be there as we are uh, approaching uh, closer to the end of the first quarter of this century maybe soon the next nobel laureate will come from the nigerian english writers and we'll have to uh, not wait for a longer time that much potential is there among the new writers in nigeria uh, with these uh, remarks uh, i would like to uh, conclude here uh, once again i extend my thanks to dr ganjawar sir and the team of the organizing committee of this uh, webinar thank you Uh, if there is any scope for uh, the discussion, uh, then uh, uh, we can go there. Uh, but already, I think uh, there are yes, no questions, uh, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nitonde, sir. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. So, friends, now My we pleasure. are. To, thank you. Thank you very much once again. We are about to conclude uh, the today's webinar. So. i am very happy to bestow vote of thanks so first of all it is my prime responsibility to owe a lot to our president honorable dr prakash dada sorunke sahib ex state minister maharashtra ml mla and president marathwada shikshan prasarak mandal aurangabad uh, again i owe a lot to uh, the secretary honorable uh, sri satish uh, bhau chavan sahib Uh, mlc and the secretary honorable msp mandal aurangabad uh, honorable jaising bhaiya sorunke the chief member uh, cdc acs college kirle dharur all the uh, cdc uh, executive honorary members and the from the on behalf of the management i thank all the resource persons and the participants i on behalf of the principal the management the vice principals and the convener and the chief organizer i thank professor dr charles joseph the keynote addresser of today's webinar professor dr deepak nayar professor dr mridula sharma ma'am and professor dr rohidas nitonde sir for making this seminar a successful one i owe a lot to the uh, professor munde sir the chief uh, web techno hub of our college events uh, gade sir and all all the participants who have given their special time for making this program a successful one thank you very much thanks a lot if i have forgotten anybody's name kindly consider it casually and from the bottom of my heart uh, i owe a lot i am really thankful to all of you i am really grateful to one and all thank you very much thanks a lot there is a note please feel the feedback form 
uh, on the given link the way link also is available on our college website www.killetharurcollege.in oblique feedback thank you very much have a nice day thanks a lot